gentlemen, welcome to Question Time. Please welcome your host, Mr. Martin Tor. David Hibbard doesn't have to applaud himself, does he? Goodness. Right, good evening, I'm Martin Tor. Um, I'm here to make sure that you all behave yourselves uh, as best we can and to thank you all for being here, you the public and our members of the cabinet to put themselves up there hopefully to be shot at. Uh, this is the first thing, the, this is the first time for Oldham Council and we all believe it's the first time it's happened in the northwest of England as well. Uh, this evening is the highlight uh, of a whole week of local democracy celebrations. We've had tours of the Civic Centre, uh, lots of skilled children coming in, lots of young people coming in. They've been had, led on tours by the Mayor, Richard Knowles, and some former mayors. We've had a local democracy exhibition at Gallery Oldham, and the, uh, the, the councillors have been on Royton Markets and Shaw Markets to this morning, and I also believe you've been on a barge in Saddleworth, and they've all come back not seasick, so that must have been okay. Uh, but tonight is all about you and your questions. We've had a huge response uh, of questions. We've got a whole list of things here we're going to get through. We've got two hours. We're going to try and get through them all. So if a debate starts dragging on, I might just have to curtail it. And if we can come back to an issue at the end, we will. But we are going to try and get through all the questions that have been sent in through Facebook, Twitter, and through the internet. And we're anticipating some questions coming in live. Uh, through the radio, through Twitter, and through the internet as well during the course of the evening. As those questions come in, they'll be on this screen here and the screen behind you so that our cabinet members can see what they are and we'll try and deal with those issues at the same time. Before we go any further, I'm going to invite each of our cabinet members to do a very brief politician's brief introduction of each so we all know who we're speaking to and what their political brief is. And we'll start with the leader, Jim McMahon. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jim McMahon, I'm a uh, ward member for Fails of Feast and I'm the leader of the council. Uh, I have a portfolio as well as being the leader which includes working with outside bodies such as Greater Manchester and the Local Government Association. Shweb? I'm Shweb Akhtar, Deputy Leader of the Council. Uh, I represent Werneth Ward and obviously the rest of the old uh, borough as well. Uh, my, I've got a cabinet portfolio as well which includes partnerships and commissioning and you may ask what does that include? Basically, basically, I've got responsibility for the Oldham Partnership, Oldham Service Board, Health and Wellbeing Board, and the Unity Partnership as well. And being the deputy is the leader, everything else that the leader doesn't want to do. <laughs> okay, David? Uh, my name's Dave Hibbert. I represent South Gelatin Ward. I'm a cabinet member for housing strategy, transport strategy, and regeneration of the borough. I also represent Bo Oldham on uh, several uh, bodies down at the Association of Greater Manchester Authority and on the Rural Commission and on the Urban Commission. Thank you, David. We'll need zigzag. Hugh? Good evening. Hugh Maddell. I'm, I'm the, the member responsible for children, young people and families and leisure. And I see tonight that we've got quite a few from the Shaw, Shaw area, so I think one of the questions will be re regarding the, the leisure provision in the, in the borough. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Jabbar? Yeah, uh, good evening everybody. My name is Councillor Abdul Jabbar. I represent Calder's Ward and my portfolio is Finance and Human Resources. Jean? Hi, my name is Jean Stratton. I'm a councillor for the Hollingwood Ward and I'm a cabinet member for Neighbourhoods, which covers things such as the devolution of uh, power to neighbourhoods, to district partnerships, and also a range of things in that would previously be known as environmental services, so highways, refuse collection, etc. Okay, thank you for that. John? Good evening. My name is John Batty. I'm deputising for Phil Harrison today. He was on holiday, but I have particular responsibility for health and also Phil's responsibilities, adult services, care of the elderly uh, and people with disabilities. And finally, but not least, Barbara. Hello. Uh, I'm Barbara Dawson. Uh, I'm also a councillor for Failsworth East. My portfolio is cooperatives and community development, which is a brand new portfolio. We believe it, there are only two in the country, uh, cabinet members for cooperatives and community development. Excellent. Okay. That's so, again, all of them leading the way again. That's <coughs> fantastic. Okay, we have two people in the audience who are here uh, who brought questions specifically. So the first one question we're going to be asked by uh, Malcolm here. So you can please turn your microphone, tell us who you are, please, Malcolm, and repeat your question. Malcolm Everton, I live in Shaw, and my question is directed at Hugh MacDonald, Cabinet Member for Recreation. 
given that the proposals are really long overdue and that the impact on the local community will be devastating, can the Cabinet member give an assurance that every effort will be made to keep Prompton Pool open until a new fit-for-purpose facility is built and that any consideration will be thorough, transparent and worthy of public confidence? Hugh, I think that's been directed at you, my mate. How can you tell us? Thanks, Malcolm, anyway, and thanks for, you know, previously giving us the, uh, at least a chance to, to look at the report. The issue around, around, I mean, quite clear, I think Julie raised this at the o OCL board about, you know, the, the facilities being opened before, before a new facility, the new facility being opened before the old facility closes, that, that I can guarantee will happen. Now, the issue around, Crom uh, the issue around Crompton Pool, I mean, as you, as you know, we're going through a full consultation, and the issues around there, we're looking at different different places to put, put it, but the likelihood at the present time could be right in Crompton School or, or, right in, Crompton School or in, in Royton Town Centre. Now, them are the two issues at the present time. So what I'm saying to you, you know, once it's completed, and we're hoping that people do involve themselves with a full consultation on it, and I, I can give you the undertaking that we will reply and we'll take on board every single comment that people have got to do. So unless there's any more detail you want on that, Malcolm, you know, that's the answer to the question. That was a good start then, wasn't it? Are you, are you happy? I'm happy with tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'll rephrase that. Are you happy with the answer? I'm happy with tonight's answer. That's very kind of you, thank you. Um, I think, Gerald, you've got a question for us. Yes, thank you. Uh, Gerald Riley, my question is... Uh, down the years, how much money has been spent on tipping and landscaping in the Beale Valley? Is it ever going to become a golf course? And if not, then what plans are there for it after what is perceived as pouring good money after bad? Right. Who did we decide was taking this one? It shuffled over to me. Did it? <laughs> I thought it might have changed since our earlier... The uh, history of the Beale Valley is that in the 1990s, the council at the time came in with a contract with the Casey Group, who were experienced in building golf courses locally in Huddersfield, Blakely uh, and Pillsworth, and it would be part of a, a landfill development. The total uh, contract cost was somewhere in the region of £22 million. When the contract was finished, there would have been an 18-hole golf course, a driving range and a clubhouse, and the council would receive, on top of that, a million pounds for other uh, leisure facilities. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of controversy about the tipping licence, which was granted by the Environment Agency. In 2000, the council changed uh, control, and Councillor Richard Knowles and his colleagues decided to cancel the contract with cases. I don't think I'm free to uh, say how much that was. I mean, it may have been public knowledge, but it was a multi-million pound settlement that went to the Casey Group not to continue with the landfill operation as it had the licence. However, the landfill operation continued with an inert waste. That, license, that uh, tipping licence and that landfill has now been completed. And when we came back into office in May this year, there's a whole shopping list that we're working through of items that we need to deal with. Many have been raised tonight. There's the Town Hall, the Town Centre, the Coliseum Theatre, Hollingwood Junction, New Schools, uh, Limecroft and the Beale Valley. And it's coincidence, but on Monday this week, Jim asked me to write a paper about the background to the Beale Valley. And this afternoon I've emailed Jim and I've emailed Huey with the background to it. The planning permission was quite clear that there was a golf course was to be built with associated landfill. As far as I'm concerned, that means the golf course has got to be built to fulfil the planning requirements. But it does mean we've got to find innovative ways of making that happen. It's about 147 acres there. It's a huge area which can be turned into a golf course. Whether it be private or municipal is yet to be decided. But there was no... Post the settlement of cases, there was no other money being put into it. Cases continued with the landfill. As I say, originally the council would have had the golf course plus a profit, but that changed. Gerald, do you want to come back on him on that one? Have you got some views? Uh, ju just if you could um, give more details about, about cases' involvement. Were cases paying the council or were the council paying cases? Uh, cases? The, the, the contract was that cases would, would tip in a, sat in a landfill cell about 1.4 million tonnes of non-inert waste. 
and the council would get uh, so much per ton uh, and cases would, I think 80% went to cases and 20% went to the council. But cases were contracted to build the golf course, to build the clubhouse and hand it all over to the council. It was profitable for cases, very profitable. It was profitable for the council because we ended up with a golf course and a clubhouse. And that's why the council had to pay a huge amount of compensation to cancel the contract. Thank you. Okay. We're getting somewhere, aren't we? We're, we're all, everyone seems happy at the moment, I'm, I'm really pleased. Um, we've got a question from Peter Batty, who said he was being here. Peter, yeah? Do you want to ask your question, please? Hello. Can you just <coughs> press your microphone? Yeah, here on. Is that okay? Yeah. You can just lean forward, because David can't pick up on the radio. All right, I will, yeah. Right, it's uh, frequently major planning proposals hit the headlines. Very often these are controversial in Oldham. Obviously the current administration are interested in dialogue dialogue with this public, or, with this, uh, public meeting tonight. Um, we wouldn't be here otherwise. My question is, will the council commit to organising similar independently chaired question times whenever a major or likely to be controversial project is being considered in order that those most affected, i.e. The, re the residents as well as the council and developer, can exchange views? I would suggest no later than two weeks from the proposal being announced because otherwise it gets more aggravated. A full, cabinet, uh, sorry, a full cabinet attendance would be preferable as they all have an input into the proposal sanctions. But I, appro but I appreciate that this may be not be feasible. Nevertheless, the major players, i.e. the leaders, cabinet member and appropriate portfolio and departmental head, at least should be present. With this, that's a pretty exhaustive question. David, I think you're going to take this one forward. Yeah, well, thanks very much for that because it's a very encouraging question because implicit in your question is appreciation of what we're doing tonight. And I thank you for that. We're absolutely committed to as much consultation as we possibly can. Uh, people quite often say that uh, we don't consult, but we do do our best and we do our very best to, again, make contact with people and give them the opportunity to um, make their feelings and opinions known. It is, as I said, I started off, Peter, thanks very much for that very encouraging question. I can give you an absolute rock-solid commitment and assurance that we will be doing things like this much more in the future and, and looking at other ways of doing it and making it... In fact, you've already seen, you've probably already seen the Cabinet going out to meet it within the community instead of staying in the Civic Centre. So we are committed to what you're asking for and you've got our assurance that we will be doing these things, particularly as this appears to have been very successful so far. <coughs> Could I uh, perhaps come in on that one as well? Sure, yeah. Are you okay for a minute, Peter, before you come back? Yeah. Yeah? Jim? Well, the, the, there's a couple of issues. One is the principle of consulting with residents before a decision is made, and in plenty of time so that it can inform the decision that's made. Sign the proposal. The proposal. Um, and presumably, if it's linked to a planning application, so if it's a development prior to an application going in, so that the final application that goes in reflects what the community wants rather than it be a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think is all very worthwhile, I suppose. Um, the difficulty would come where an application doesn't have council involvement, but it's still a major development, and whether we look to facilitate something like this with the developer, even if it's not a development, we probably just need to look at that in a bit more detail. But I, I, I think the principle of we need to do more, actively engage, um, but also for people to accept that at times we will need to make decisions that are in the overall interest of the borough that might not be necessarily the interest of a handful of people. Um, I think the, the particular issue you're talking about isn't that, um, but there will be occasion you could imagine where that just become an issue and we have to say we've consulted but actually we've still come to a conclusion that you might not agree with. And I think that's, that, well, that's that life, isn't it? Yeah. That's life, I guess. I don't think this microphone's working either. Mute, hang on. I'm, I'm wired up here, I've got things on my back, I've got things in my ear. Got I'm not, I feel like Robocop and nothing's working. <laughs> Is it uh, working now? No? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. It's the radio. It's the radio people who can't hear me. Which is probably a good thing, actually, David. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got the three people. Do you want to come back on that? Well, if I can. Yeah. yeah do, do you want to switch your microphone on? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah. You, you you picked up exactly what it is I'm talking about. And yes, I do appreciate the fact that you've done this tonight. I think people will appreciate it much more in future. As I say, it's got to be feasible where you could, you know, you can't have the whole cabinet in a situation like this. But certainly, where things are going to be controversial, where it's going to affect not just a handful of people, Jim, 
but quite a large number of people. Mm. And I think the council's got a, a duty to make sure that it does not consult with, but dialogue with the people of the area. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, and the, the, there also needs to be a forum where um, it doesn't have to be a major development for people to feel that they can come and have their say. And I think w we are at the moment reviewing how full council works because it doesn't uh, work well to engage the public so that people can come and feel comfortable about expressing a view. It doesn't work particularly well for ward councillors to raise an issue that affects their ward or their yeah. constituents. So w we are looking at full council full stop and trying to make it more accessible and less uh, of a talking shop where we ramble on for hours on issues that we have no control over, which is generally the case in full council. Okay. Thank you. Well, just to prove we are going out live, we've got a first question. Somebody out there in the great wide world has been listening in. The question's um, on there, and it's uh, from P. Bear. And it's, it's been announced today that Oldham now has the highest number of people out of work for a decade. What is the council going to try and do to help those people? Jim, do you want to have a look at that one first, and then perhaps pass it down the line? I, I can do it, but Dave will want to, yeah. to, to make a comment, I suppose. Re reflecting on the figures that have come out, Oldham um, is in a similar position to the rest of the country, and the most concerning thing about the figures that have come out is youth unemployment. Uh, but being so high, it does feel, and it is a political point, that we're going to end up with a generation that's been cast aside where they can't see what the future is. Uh, and as politicians, we're in a very difficult position. We are dealing with a world recession. We're dealing with uh, national policies that are being set and budget constraints. But we know we need to do something locally, and we can't just accept that this is it. Um, and we'll do that. But the, the most important thing is job creation. You know, we can... Um, we can do regeneration, but if it doesn't lead to jobs and quality jobs, um, and if we don't educate our people so that they can go out and get good quality jobs and not continually uh, in low-paid employment, um, then the cycle just won't stop. Oldham will always be uh, affected but the first by a recession if we haven't got an educated population. David? Yes, please. Thank you, Martin. Uh, some time ago, we realised that the, one of the difficulties we've got in Oldham was that there was not a sufficient pool of people with uh, the skills that modern industry required. And when uh, people are contemplating investing millions of pounds into a town, there are several things they look at. There's available skilled workforce, there's available accommodation and a good transport network. Now, we've got the, the last two, but at the time, we, was, we would have struggled to provide a suitably and large, well-equipped, transferable skilled workforce. So we said about turning Oldham into a university town, and that was when we started to work with Huddersfield University, and we ended up with the Oldham College University, etc. And we've now got one of the uh, highest numbers of uh, students and pupils in, in Greater Manchester. In fact, the Oldham Sixth Form College was built to uh, accommodate a, a particular number of people, which... 750. 750, and it's now well into the... Two and a half thousand. Two and a half thousand, thanks John for the figures, because John was particularly involved with that at the time, that's why he's au fait with these figures more than I am. But one of the problems we've got, we have a unique selling point in that Oldham has got a higher proportion of young people than most other communities in the, in the country. Now, when things are good, that's brilliant. It is a real good selling point because people know that there's a young workforce who've got the, the modern skills, all the IT equipment, uh, the, the abilities uh, to take on modern jobs. But when things are going bad, the problem we've got is that you've got students graduating and coming out of no work. You've got youngsters leaving school and there's no jobs there. So suddenly a high proportion of young people becomes problematic. So what I've done, I've got officers working now on schemes and projects and make uh, plans and ideas to ensure that the, there's many jobs that are made available that are attractive to the young people. Because we don't want uh, young people with no jobs, no future. Unfortunately, many of the national policies are leading towards that. But we've got to, uh, we've got to fight against that. I was at a conference the other day. And with these uh, demographic experts giving their analyses of uh, trends and whatever, and they were saying, this is it's going up, the unemployment's going up, this is going and shit. But they didn't come out with any solutions. 
Now, Oldham's got to come out with the solutions. We've, we've got to adopt the attitude here in Oldham, and we are doing, that, OK, they're the trends, but we don't just have to live with them, and we've got to do things about it. So it is an issue that we've got tremendous concerns about, and we've got a, an equally tremendous determination to address the issue as best we possibly can. Thank you, David. Has anybody in the audience got an issue or want to speak on that? Has anybody got any clues? I mean, we just lost uh, Warburton's the other week, and we've lost BAE Systems, and that's just two we know about. Um, which we, I, I wondered if the council, Jim or Dave, or did, were you aware of those two issues before they came to, into the, local, into the uh, public domain? We, we were aware of both of them. We have briefings with employers when they're looking either to uh, increase the workforce or, or to decrease it, as in the case of, uh, of Warburton's and BA systems. And we put uh, support packages in place to support the individuals who are being made redundant to give them other opportunities. There is a broader point, and the broader point is this. When times were good, they weren't that good for Oldham. Yeah. You know, when we're seeing the boom in the major cities, actually the ripples didn't come that far into Oldham and we didn't get the type of uh, boom in economy that the place has seen. In the last decade, there's been no economic growth in Oldham and the only growth has been in the public sector. And we're seeing today what happens through the budget settlements to the public sector. It's been, it's been decimated. So we need to be different and we can't just rely on other people to sort Oldham's mess out. Now, to me, there is room for a council with ambition, not just ambition because it isn't enough, but, people, but an administration who are willing to make tough decisions and make money available. And we've only got one budget and it will mean that something else has to give. But if we invest today, when all the other local authorities and councils have put up the drawbridge because they're just trying to deal with the budget cuts and they're not looking ahead, I think there is room for a town that's thirsty and hungry um, to get investment inwards. Because you know, there are still people who are investing. We just need to convince them that Oldham is a place worth investing in. It can't just be that we've got cheap land. It can't just be that we've got derelict sites that we can hand over. Because you know what, there are loads of towns in that position. We need to say that Oldham has something different and we need to define what that difference is. Uh, I, I might just to move on because I know we've got a lot of issues and we've been going 25 minutes already. So I know Schwab wants to make a, a comment on this just, issue. Just quickly pick up, pick up on, on the point that, that we've got a higher unemployment rate in terms of young people. Uh, we've got a, a higher population of young people in Oldham and, and young people are our asset and we do really value that. And when we came into control in May, we, we reintroduced the junior university, if people remember. So we, we re, reinvested in that, in that particular uh, area in terms of £200,000 because we value young people and we want to make sure that they've got the right skills to take this borough forward. And the other th things that we're looking at is the apprenticeship schemes as well. Not, 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 across the, uh, not across Oldham Council but right across other partners that we could work with to, to reintroduce the apprenticeship schemes. And then we've just recently going to open the Science Centre as well. And, and as, as an administration we do understand that we need to do more in terms of our are young people and we will take that responsibility on. Thank you, Sean. Okay, anybody want to make a comment? Your chance, yes, Gerald. Uh, could you tell me what the Science Centre actually does? Well, it, it does what it says on the tin. It, um, <laughs> it, tra it trains young people to be scientists of the future. Uh, and the reason it's important, I went uh, to visit in, in the first week that the Science Centre was open, um, isn't just that it provides educational opportunities for people in Oldham, it's a regional science centre. Yeah. So yeah. the people who were there were from Manchester, from Ashton, from Barry, Bolton and beyond, who were coming into Oldham, who would never have considered coming to Oldham uh, before to study science, because uh, having a brand new centre that's a centre of excellence uh, does do that. And it's also recognising if all we do today is train for the jobs we have today, yeah. when the economy moves forward, we're not going to have a workforce that's trained for the future. Uh, the, the, you know, in terms of digital technologies, the science and technology market, that's where the UK economy is going. And if we don't train our young people up now, by the time they go for yeah. a university, the jobs aren't going to be in Oldham because we haven't got a trained workforce for it. So we're preparing today and investing today in science and technology, and the Green Technology Centre is linked uh, into that. So that when the jobs do come up, and we're also working to get the jobs out in Oldham and Greater Manchester, that our people can apply for them. But the second bit is, we can spend all this money training our young people, but when they get trained, they'll leave Oldham because they don't want to stay in the town. And that's the second uh, bit that we're looking at. So th th there isn't a direct answer about, we'll do this and it'll solve it all. It's a, it's a very complex problem, and that's not a cop-out, 
but, but the answer is, is it will mean that we have to be more creative and be more complex in the way that we bring resources together to address it. It's about housing, it's about skills, it's about environment, it's about being a pleasant and safe place that people want to raise their families, it's about having the right type of housing so people say, I want to live in Oldham because it's got the house that I want. It's all that. Um, and really, we're starting from a very low base, as I said, a decade of decline, um, and, and we're just catching up. But I can tell you there's nobody more hungry to get this sorted than the people on the top table. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, just on that point, about you made, you, made, you made the point about people coming into the town, for it's a regional science centre, and we'll be drawing in students from all over the place, which they will then hopefully spend money in Oldham and, and increase our economy. Uh, you were at a, bre a business breakfast two weeks ago when Metrolink was discussed with the business community, um, and there's a question just coming from James Mockford on Facebook. What are the council doing to ensure they capitalise on Metrolink? I have another question came in earlier about that, which I'll add to it in a moment. But at that business breakfast, Jim, you said the council has to make sure that when Metrolink comes, it isn't just a vehicle for people to leave Oldham. Would you like to elucidate on that answer for our uh, audience this evening? It, well, if, if I give a kind of my view on it, and Dave perhaps will give some kind of practical examples of what we're doing. Um, first of all, for too long, politicians in Oldham have assumed that Metrolink is the answer full stop. Yeah. And all we need to do is wait for Metrolink to come and all our ills will be sorted. And it won't, because Metrolink will take people out as soon as it will bring people in. And if we haven't got anything in Oldham Town Centre and Oldham for people to come to, then they're not going to come. It'll be a one-way ticket. So we're starting, to, again, from a low base, but we are absolutely determined that when that Metrolink goes down Union Street, Union Street looks a lot different than it does now. But, but, but even yesterday we had a, a debate, as far as I'm concerned, um, and it can go in the press and it maybe it gives pressure for officers to actually sort it, the Metrolink stop at Mums is inadequate, it's not good enough. It's effectively bus shelters. So we're saying that as our new, our, a new gateway to Oldham for people coming in from that side of town, the best you can expect is a row of bus shelters and that's it. And we expect people to come and invest when we're not willing to invest ourselves. But when you go to Newton Heath you, and you see the Central Park, you see this all singing, all dancing, state-of-the-art interchange. And that's what we should be getting for all them. And we told officers uh, what's on the table isn't good enough, and they need to go away and do that. But we need to do something with Union Street. There's no point just having a fancy uh, interchange if when people come to see takeaways with, sh with the shutters pulled down during the day, or when they go past old buildings, it might look very nice, but aren't being used properly, uh, or haven't got a, a future that's secure or mumps on Rhodes Bank that have just got vacant buildings with no practical uh, modern day use. So we'll be coming forward uh, before Christmas with plans, not just a master plan because Oldham's had 100 master plans, all of yeah. which go straight into the recycling bin because they're not worth the paper or the consultancy fees that have been paid out. Um, practical examples, including land ownership, of if we move quickly, so this is what we can do. But to do any of that, I mean, it was tough enough five, ten years ago when there was a bit of cash. To do that now, it's really difficult. Um, but as I said, there are quite a lot of councils uh, are reining back. They're not spending money because of the service budget situation. There is room for a council who wants to invest, and we will make money available to do that with the private sector, with council resources, with European money, uh, and grant funding to make sure that we do it. Um, and hopefully the plans that will come forward before Christmas will give people an insight to do that. But don't judge us before Christmas on an artist's impression. Judge us in a year, five years, ten years' time and see if it's made a difference or not. David, before I invite you to, uh, to elucidate on that, we had a question sent in by a, a trader at uh, Rhodes Bank, Mountain Feet, Simon. And he asks, which is very relevant to what we're talking about here, is how are local businesses going to survive the Metrolink chaos of the next three years? I'd love some feedback, please. And if I can throw my two penny thing, because I work in Union Street at the Chronicle, um, we have utter chaos in Oldham Town Centre whenever we get a bit of snow. We've got utter chaos now with the Metrolink, and I dread to think how I'm going to get home once the snow and the Metrolink come together. And I think that's from me. That, and do we all agree? So you can talk to me if you want to join in. We all agree, don't we? <laughs> See, so it's not just me, David, having a pop at you. Well, there's not much you can do about the snow except deal with it when it's uh, arrived on the floor, and that wouldn't be uh, within my portfolio. But the fact is about Metrolink, you can't... There's an old saying about omelettes. You can't make an omelette without cracking eggs. And I know it's a boring old cliche, but this bringing Metrolink through the town centre is not simply a case of putting tracks on the surface of the road. Beneath that road, for probably for a hundred 
hundred years have been gas pipes, have been water pipes, sewage pipes, there are BT lines, and having walked round with the old hard hat on and the high visibility coat, which makes me look like a, a bit of a mushroom, uh, that I've realised just how complex and complicated a, a project this is. Now, having seen that and seen the size of some of the sewers and some of the pipes that have got to be moved, and people say, what's going on in St Mary's Way? But that can't have anything to do with Union Street. But it, in fact, it does, because sewerage systems have got to be diverted elsewhere. So they've had to go up St Mary's Way to rejoin the system wherever they do rejoin the system. But having seen just how complex and complicated it is, it actually is a significant improvement for the Transport for Greater Manchester Authority, who are the authorities? the body that are doing this work it's a significant in, uh, achievement for them to actually keep the traffic moving at all now it mentions three years in the question, I don't believe that the chaos and the upset is going to last it's be anywhere near as bad as it is for three years uh, the word from me is that sometime by next uh, next spring the word that has been given to me is that is that spring it, in 2012? yeah, that's next year isn't it? yeah well yeah yeah. We, keep, we keep being told we're from about 14 <laughs> or 15 months away with this. Well, part of the difficulty was that, and I was going to say about the, the new uh, tra traffic control system that was brought in, but that's not had an impact on the um, 3B system, 3B phase, which is going through the town centre. There are two phases, 3A, 3B. One takes it along the existing line to a temporary month station, and 3B brings it off that existing line through the town centre down Union Street and it will rejoin at Mump Station. At that stage, 3A, the section between Werneth and, Mer and Mumps, will be closed down. But the work that is being done, that, that should be running, uh, that you know, track along 3A should be running by spring next year. The work that we see now, all the upheaval and all the work on underneath the roads and the digging and the diversions, should be nowhere near as bad by a similar time next year as 3A uh, materialises. So, uh, all we can ask for is patience. You know, these are very, it's a very difficult, complex, complicated project, uh, and we're doing our best to minimise the disruption, but it is inevitable that there's going to be some disruption. John may wish to add something on this, because well, he's I'm, on the Transport Authority with me. I'm, I'm going to assert my authority here, because we're getting... Um, we've got one quick question here about the Metrolink. When will the Metrolink come to shore? And then I'm going to close down the Metrolink question for a while, because we've got other councillors here who haven't yet spoken and I want to widen the debate a bit. So we can just answer the last question from uh, whatever that, that Twitter question there, I can't. C-S-T-O-S Gale. Costos Gale. There we go. Costos Gale on Twitter. When will Metrolink come to shore? Do we have any answer on that? Do anybody know? In the year 2014 stroke 15 in that financial year. Mm -hmm. so that the answer was in 2014. That's what, two years? It's well, that was the extension from Mumps into Shore Station along the existing line. Yes, and then through to Rochdale. And then through to Rochdale. So in two years' time, the existing Metrolink will go from... Well, by then it will be at the... Uh, it will come down Union Street by then, will it? Yes, it'll come down Union yeah. Street. To and then it will go on from there on. along the existing line to Shaw yes. and then on into Rochdale. Yes. And of course, putting it on the existing line is far less complex than taking it through a town centre. Well, clearly, yes. I mean, you try and go through Drawlton Town Centre at the moment, it's a nightmare, isn't it? I presume that once the line starts coming out of wherever it comes up from Worth and down Union Street, it's going to be a bit difficult, but we'll have to live with it, I guess, as you said. Do you want to make a comment, Jim? It, d d just a very quick comment. Um, f f first of all, for business in the, in the town centre, the council hasn't done enough to support them through Metrolink Works. And it's a fact. We just left people to get on with it um, in the belief, and it's a correct belief, that ultimately it will be worth waiting for. But it's a lot of comfort for the businesses who won't be here to see it open. Uh, now, we've introduced a free car park into the town centre and we've managed to uh, get support from the shopping centres to do that. That's intended to bring people in um, to experience the town centre. We are setting up a town centre task force uh, that I will chair, which is about the wider things we need to do in the town centre. There are some structural failings in the town centre that we need to address. Um, but fundamentally, um, the roadworks aren't as bad as people have an impression they are, and there are people who just won't come anywhere near Alden Town Centre because they believe that they're going to be in a queue trying to get in for half an hour, when the reality is most people aren't. Um, 
and there's also a downer on Oldham Town Centre. So, if, you know, if you look at the comments that are left on local websites, it's Rockdale Town Centre is better, or Ashton Town Centre is better, and there's nothing in Oldham Town Centre. But if you consider the shops, Debenhams, Topshop, River Island, Waterstones, neighbouring town centres haven't got those. Uh, but they're in Oldham. You know, the, the, those are the type of shops that people travel for, um, but they're here. Now, there needs to be more, uh, and we accept that. And myself and the Chief Executive have been out on a walk around the town centre, and the number of shutters that are down just isn't acceptable. Um, but Oldham Town Centre is not closed for business. Um, we're, fa we're faring far better than our neighbouring uh, towns of Ashton and Rochdale. It's a fact. Um, but, you know... There's no point can I just, in, no point can in I just ask you on that one? When you say it's a fact, are you talking about empty square footage? Yeah, yeah empty shop units. So it's a fact now. Obviously, TJ Hughes closing was a major blow. Um, it's not something that we would want to happen, clearly, but it's obviously something that's outside of our control. It was a national decision, and every TJ Hughes in the country closed when Oldham's closed. It wasn't Oldham. And they didn't pull out of Oldham. The company went bust. And that's a reflection of the economic circumstance that we're in. But, you know... There's no point in people saying Oldham's got nothing now, because if people don't use Oldham, however bad it is today, it'll be a lot worse tomorrow if people don't get in there and shop. Mike Flanagan's always telling me that uh, we've, to look at how many shops are actually taken in there and not look at how many are empty. But human nature, you count up the empty ones, you don't count up the 70 that are, that are occupied, do we? David, do you want to ask a question? I just wanted to... Please state your name, please, and tell Sorry, us who you are. Sorry, my name's Dave Whaley, I'm the editor of the Oldham Chronicle. I'd just like the people of Shaw to, to not to run off and be frightened here by John Batty's answer. I think he needs to reconsider his answer there, where he said Shaw's not going to get a metro in 2000 until 2014. In the original plan of 3A, the metro was going to reach months by autumn and be in Shaw by the spring. That's about six months. It shouldn't take two years once it opens in the spring to reach Shaw. You will not see Durka and Shaw Station not being used all the way till you go to 3B. I, I can't see that. May be, I may be wrong, I can't David. see that being right. So I don't think we should take it that Shaw will not get a tra tram until 2014. I don't think that's correct. Maybe wrong. I apologise I've got it wrong, but I know that the final track through the town centre in Oldham is 2014. No, I accept. I think, the, I think, yeah, I think it, it might be coming down Union Street up to 14, but it might be carrying on into Shaw and into Rochdale before then. Is that what you're understanding, Jim? No, 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 no it'll, it'll go on to Shaw, but the Rochdale connection will be later. Yeah. Right. That's, That's okay, because Rochdale is down the road anyway. It wants to go there anyway. Quite right, I agree. We want to stay in Oldham, don't we? <laughs> yes, Malcolm. <laughs> Can you, just put, can you just put your microphone down a touch? I can. David can't pick up on the radio. The Cabinet members are all very, very busy people. But I would urge you, when you have a, a spare day, or even a half day, take a trip to Bury. The town is absolutely buzzing. They come from all over the north of England, the Midlands, the coaches are everywhere. The people absolutely love it. You can't get a seat in any of 20 cafes in and around the market. The new complex at the Rock is out of this world. If Berry can do it, so can we. I think that's a fair comment because I've been to, to the Rock and it is a magnificent development. But I, I, I just wonder how long that was in the planning and if that was in the planning and paid for long before 2008 when the world went into a spiral recession, the like of which I've never known. I I'll make Sorry, the point, uh, if, if you look at the Rock, the vast majority of stores that are in there are in Oldham. The flagship store, Debenhams, we've got in Oldham. Primark's in Oldham. That's the draw. Absolutely. Yeah, just can we have one speaker? If you want to say something, you have to tell us your name. Yeah, my name is Peter Callan. Nobody at all comes to Oldham. Everybody just disappears. I don't myself. I go to Bury. Because there's no satisfaction at all. I know people that have stores on Oldham Market and just pulled out. They've just priced them out of business. Uh, so you're suggesting that the, the price of the higher of the, the store is the issue, not the fact that the market is where Tommy Field is, is behind the market hall itself. That in, in a, the same. You know, there's been complaints about people with vans, or you've got to move your van up before you actually put the, the stuff onto the store that you want to sell. I think we're getting into a massive issue about parking here in our attendance. Um, it's not about parking, it's attendance. about the people have moved off for that reason, because you need a little bit of sympathy if you stood out in freezing cold trying to put things on a market stall first thing in the morning. Wait, well, I used to do it many years ago when I left school. You know that. In the street. No, but look, look what it's done to me. I've got no air now at 14. <laughs> well, but, 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 but what I'll say to give comfort is that we are looking at the fees and charges on the market as part of the task force. So the, the suggestion is from the floor that the market's gone. Is it too late? Um, 
I, it, it's, it's not going to be an easy task to bring it back to what it was, but if you look at markets uh, across the country, markets have changed and they've suffered from supermarkets and they've suffered from Primark and they've suffered from discount shops who are all selling the same type of goods. Can um, I throw one into the mix here? Because um, I, I spent a lot of my private life and half of my professional life was in Ashton, working for the Ashton Reporter before I came back to work in Oldham where I was born and where I've lived all my life. And the market in Ashton is very much in the centre with the, you've got the Metro London's development, you've got the, the shopping development, the arcades, you've got the town hall complex, you've got the indoor market and you've got Stamford Street and the market is in the very hub of that f yeah. very busy retail mix mm. do you not think that if Oldham Market was in a similar situation and I know that the geographical situation isn't easy that Oldham Market may still be thriving can I come in on that? Because I, I, I'm sure if anybody wanted uh, from the start to look at where they were going to put the outdoor market the worst place they could have picked is where it is because things have changed since it started there. And that was why we decided uh, a few years back to bring stalls into the town centre, into the... Uh, Curzon Street area. Curzon Street area, area. Yes, yes, exactly. Now, at Walpa, and they seem to be doing all right. I hope they are doing all right. But the fact is that these days, people, people can get market goods at market prices indoors. They can go on to multi-storey car parks and park the cars and be warm and dry. And a lot of the goods that markets sell are sold in far more comfortable environments than markets. I think people will look at markets and the, the reasons for the decline and they will identify whatever reason suits their own particular thoughts and prejudices in quotation marks. So I think this is far more complex than simply saying the rents are too high. There's a lot more to it. You go down into Manchester, go down to Harper Market, and that's surrounded by shops, and that's doing very well. You go up to Berry, as, as, as has been said, and I go up there for the food hall. I think that's just, that, for me, is the attraction of Berry Market, is the meat and fish food hall. Excellent. Now, we would like to get something like that here, and, and, of that sort of level. But M Berry has done an excellent job at, forgive the pun, marketing itself, at marketing its market over the years. And that's why you get coach trips going in. But if you go okay. into the outdoor market itself... Apart from the fact that it's bustling and busy, it's not selling special goods of any particular interest to me. Okay, if I can just, yeah. sorry Raheem, do you want one last comment from Raheem and then I am going to move it on because I'm conscious that we've got cabinet members haven't spoke yet. We've been going for nearly 45 minutes and uh, I don't... Yeah, yeah, we're going to give you a chance. I'd like this lady to have a chance first. My question's different in this well. Can you just switch your microphone on and tell us your name and your question, please? Uh, yeah, it's, not, it's just a follow-up with that. Certainly. Just to reply to the people. I'm called Rona Lewis, and I live in Shaw. And just a, a, a quick question, a, a comment about uh, the discussion of markets. We all know, if we've lived in Oldham a long time, that we had a very thriving market. We had the best in the country. Yeah. Our friends from all over England would come visit us just to go to the markets. So, um, you know, we, we can't blame where it is. It's always been there. We can't blame where it is. So you need to find out what you did wrong. And you need now to find out how you can put it right. And it does come down to finances. Stallholders don't make that much money. No. They're not a big store. All the stallholders that we used to visit on Olden Market for 50 years, since you were a baby, they are all still in Bury. And we visit them still. We go to Bury to visit them. We would have visited them had you kept them in Oldham, but you didn't. Is there anybody else who's not spoken yet? I mean, Jean, have you got a view on this? I know it's not it's your particular specialism, but I know you're an Oldham person, and you're, you're an Oldham teacher, and you're an Oldham person, and you love Oldham. Have you got a view on this? I have got a view on it. I am Oldham born and bred, and I was brought up in Oldham. I went to old school, I went to Havershaw School, and I actually worked for Peter Hack, was my first Saturday job um, when I was still in school folding jumpers on his market stall. And so I also then went to work in Littlewoods in Oldham and I was in Littlewoods on the Saturday morning when the old market hall burned down and actually at that time the top floor of what's now the Primark building looked out over where the market hall was and I can remember standing there in tears. So I've got fond memories of the market. 
Um, I think, unfortunately, that was a long time ago. That was when I was 18. And I think over the years, the way that things have happened with out-of-town places for people to go to and with places like Primark springing up and selling things at the same prices as similar market traders can sell them, that it's become increasingly difficult for market traders. But as we've already said, we, we can see that if they can do it in Bury, then we need to look at how we can help to make it be revitalised in Oldham. And the, 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 there, there is a broader point, and it relates to market income and car parking income, is that the council is so dependent on the money coming in, and we're talking millions of pounds from the two. Um, and it gets lost in the, in the budget, and I think at times we don't realise um, not just the direct financial value it brings, or it's significant, but if we just reinvested a small amount into giving something back to the traders, I, 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 I'm not as uh, kind of down about markets. I think if it's done in the right way, um, and if it is priced competitively, and if it's got the right customer and the footfalls in the right place and the stores are placed right, um, I think it can work. Um, and to be honest, we, if we're not in the business of wanting all them to be the best at everything it does, and that includes markets, then we shouldn't be here. Well, he was, that, was your point on a similar issue, or was it something separate? Separate. Is it, have you got a question for yes. us, yeah? yeah. And it's, on the, it's on the agenda. Good evening. My name's Mohammed Rahim, and I live in Oldham. Um, the first question is around the consultation. Um, in terms of representing all the different communities of Oldham, what methods are being used, apart from... Uh, I'm talking more around this. This is the middle of the radio. Consultation <laughs> around changes to Oldham, Oldham provision, ledger provision. Um, the reason I ask is, uh, for some of you know, I've been working around in the communities for a number of years, and on a regional scale as well. There was an active people survey that was done a few years back around barriers to sport and health and in terms of what participation there is as well. From an ethnic minority point of view, there was hardly any statistics. The reason being is the methods that were used at the time didn't, basically they didn't access any uh, from the ethnic minority communities. Um, the reason I ask this is because in it is mentioned the possible closure or transfer to a community partner of Glodic Pool. Um, one of the only provisions we've got in terms of a leisure facility in uh, the Glodic and the surrounding areas there. Um, I did a report good ten years back in terms of the barriers to um, you know, people accessing sports and health facilities and one of the main things was safety that came out of there and people did not want to walk all the way from areas like Glodic to Oldham Sports Centre in the evenings. So by shutting or transferring this, I'd like to know what partner as well uh, you think is it an organisation within um, the Glodic or surrounding areas that is being considered? Hugh, have you got an answer for us? Yeah, I've got an answer. You know, anyway, thanks for the, you've also written in the question, Ryan, yeah. and thanks very much for that. The issue around, you know, and I can understand where you're coming from with, with Gladick, the issue around Gladick is that we've had no, no, nobody from the community, you know, in any language has had a reply back from it. And, and I think what that means now is I think we have to look a bit better to get them, them, them you know, the, the, the consultation back, otherwise it's not going to be a good consultation. The issue around the pool, there's a number of things going on at the present time, discussions going on with regard to whether, whether that stays or whether it goes. You know, and I think you, you find that somewhere in the document. And there's issues around that because maybe, and I'm only saying maybe, if OCL are going to make a bid for the contract, which I believe they are, are going to do, it, and possibly in coots with, uh, with Rochdale, then if, if that goes ahead, they, they may be likely that they, they will bid for that, that centre to remain open. Now, as I said, you know, the, I think the issue, you, 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 your main part of your issue is, is around the consultation. And what you're saying, Ray, it, it, it's not getting through to the Asian community. Is that, is is that what you're saying? Well, we've not just got the Asian community now, we've got communities that have migrated from other European countries as well. Now, <clears throat> as far as I know, these are being kept in the reception areas of the pool, and 
there's no, nothing that's been done in terms of actually physically going out there and consulting with the communities. I don't think anybody's going to... I'll be very, very surprised to see if you get more than 100 filled in yeah. at the pool from uh, these different ethnic minority communities. Can you leave that with me, Ray? Yes. And I'll, I'll take that on. And I think if, if you can pick that up... I have a second question. You know, we'll, we'll take that on and really do it, because it's a matter quite clear that we need a consultation to be full and thorough. And obviously on that point, it's not thorough at the present time. Question Sorry, Raheem, is your question relevant to the, the answer that you gave? Is it a supplementary? It's a separate question. Is it a separate, separate question? Yeah, so I've got, I've got, yeah, okay, I've got another debate. I've got a question on that debate. All right, if you so we'll, that we'll come back to you. Do you want to switch your microphone and tell us your name, please? Uh, it's Alan Neal, I'm from Shaw. Um, just sort of in response to what's been said by uh, Councillor MacDonald and the gentleman sat here, I do believe today that Alden Council have sort of changed that proposal and they are now planning on closing Bloody Pool, not handing it over to the community. So do you want to, an answer on that? Are you, are you suggesting... I'll put an answer on that, yeah. The suggestion, Alan, is that you've heard today that the council have now made a decision yes. to close Gloddick Pool. Yes, and even so, circulation... You? Yeah, if, I mean, with that, Alan, I mean, it, it, I mean, all sorts of rumours will go around at the present time. It's ne inevitable within a consultation. And obviously people have, have views on it. But I can assure you at this stage, there's, you know, you, you may have got a document there, but at this stage within the consultation, there's no decision been made about anything until the consultation completed, then we'll come back and, and this will be fed back to people who, who you know, who, who've actually made a comment into it, it can be fed back to, you know, the, that, the issues will be fed back but there's no issue being made at the present time on any closures. Well it was on the council website this morning. Well, I, I, should, well whatever it is, and I don't know what you're reading from there Alan, but it, it, there's no decision being made on any closures at this time. Can we just, uh, can we ask the leader, I'm sure the leader will, can we, do you mind if I just ask him to interject here? <coughs> Alan, just, just push the button please mate, thanks. Can you, uh, uh, Jim, can you enlighten us on that one please? Well, the, 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 there's a broader issue, um, and it might have kept people's notice. There might be a broader issue, Jim, but the question was, is something on the website this morning which says that Gloddick Bath is closing? Well, well, if we can see what there is, then, then we can respond. But I can, I can tell you categorically, uh, members have not made a decision, it goes to council in December as part of the budget process. Okay, um, I presume this, this has been print, printed from the uh, website this morning, is it? it's page two of four. Key findings, Gloddick Swimming Pool and Crompton Pool and Fitness Centre have significant subsidies per user. Uh, Gloddick Swimming Pool and Fitness Centre and Sports Centre are least well used of the facilities, uh, with falling usage significant year on year. Do you want to just tell me where it is, this bit? Because it's a massive piece of document. Well, is it weaving the line here? The original proposal was that... Uh, well, do you want to read it out, Alan, for us? The bit that says, you say that says it's going to close. That's the thing. No, it's the proposal. The, pro mm -hmm. the original proposal was that Gloddick Pool would be uh, either handed over to the community or um, it would be... A pri or down. somebody private come into it. Second, sorry. Or somebody private come into it, you know, there's... A private uh, user, a private contractor would refurbish it and operate it as a private operation. Well, the, the actual wording was it would either be handed over to the community or it would be closed. And then the amendment this morning that was on the website was that it would be closed. Well, I'm saying on that, Alan, it, you know, it, it is clearly it, it, not in our mind at the present time to the consultation is through to close that facility. Yeah. Gloddick Leisure Pool clause, user groups to be transferred to Alden Sports Centre or other, other venues. Is that a proposal or are they saying it's, it's a proposal for consultation? Right. The, so original that's what the original proposal for consultation was that it was either to be handed sure. to the community groups yeah. or it's it the same for And now so you're saying right. the proposal is it's going to close. So the, the, the issue is, Hugh, that they said the, the, uh, part of the, the original document was saying that the consultation was that Gloddick Pool could be handed over to local groups or handed over to a private contractor. The website is now saying, if I understand you right, Alan, that it's now, the, the, the proposal is now to either close it or not, in fact, hand it over to the 
a community or a private user? What I'm saying there's a number of options within the, within, within the proposal what they're likely to what we're looking at. You know that could be one of the things we're looking at. But at the present time, there, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly just putting it again, Alan. There's no decision been made on anything at all within this within this consultation. And there is speculation. I can, I can understand there is speculation about what will happen. And, and there may, maybe somebody within your own group might just turn around and say, "Oh yeah, I'll bet you this happened, I'll bet you that." And it may happen. I'm not saying it won't. But overall, I, I can I'll give you the undertaking that this consultation will be full and thorough, and you'll get the end result of it. And, but when that comes out, there'll be further further discussions on that. And Jim uh, promised that earlier on, and we'll have further discussions on it at the end of the day. But there's nothing in there, it's part of the proposal, there's nothing in, in the consultation, and what comes through the consultation is what we'll listen to. Sorry, you don't want to give us your switch or give us your name, please. My name's Joanne Neal. I think the concern is that you've had to change the proposal halfway through the consultation. Well, so that document that gentleman's got actually explains different to what your website now says. Well, I, I mean, I honestly don't know what the website says, but as far as, I, as I'm concerned, we're still going on the document. Is it, is, it, is, it would be true to say that an earlier report that came before us had just that proposal in to shut it. And it was members who said we should give the community the option of running it themselves. Sells. And that was added in afterwards. So whether there's been a genuine error and somebody has uploaded a previous report. Um, but I can say categorically there's been no decision made from members um, that that will close. Uh, but, and I don't need to say this, Martin, because it's relevant to the uh, Crompton situation as well. Um, by the time this budget settlement finishes, we would have had half of our council revenue budget taken away. So if people think that we can continue business as usual and services aren't going to be affected and facilities won't need to close, um, then it's, it, it's just not have any base in reality. You know, under the previous administration, we've seen libraries closed, the mobile library was, uh, was closed, respite centres were shut. That's not a criticism, that's just how you balance a budget. You, you know, you, we are a service uh, provider, so we see the people or facilities. £24 million pounds we've got to find this year, a further £14 million. Pounds next year. We can't find that kind of money without looking at facilities and staff because that's the business that we're in, facilities and people. Um, and everything has to be on the table. Now the, the difference, and there is a difference between uh, the Gloddick situation and the Crompton situation is that, and I think people have been disingenuous if, they, if they're saying this hasn't been the case. For years, I mean this must have been since 2007, um, the option to replace the pools at Crompton and Royton has been on the table. It was intended when the Chatterton Centre was built that the follow-on would be that a new facility would be built there. That's not news. And I think if people say um, this has come from nowhere and it's about saving money, it's not true. This doesn't save the council a great deal of money at all because the, the repayments on the new facility, as you'd expect, are substantial. This is about saying that the pools at Royton uh, and Crompton are not fit for purpose. And with the best will in the world, they're really not going to be fit for purpose, even if we do uh, a remodel as, as people have uh, suggested. Now, we are looking at saying each district will have a leisure facility, and whether people like it or not, Shaw, Crompton and Royton is a district. And for that to have two leisure centres when everybody else has one, I'm afraid just isn't an option because the money isn't there to have an enhanced service anywhere. And what we do need to make sure is that where we do have a service provision, that it is the best that we can possibly afford. And it's my belief that a new facility, and there is a debate about where it goes, I accept, a new facility is the answer uh, for that part of the world. But it's a consultation, we're going to listen, and people need to use the opportunity now not to say, well, politicians will say that anyway, won't they? And not to respond and send in the views, because it's vital. If you don't tell us, we don't know. Thanks, Jim. Now, I, there's a whole range of people putting their hands up here. Can we start with you, Warren, at the back? You were the first one. Thank you. Tell, tell us your name and tell us... Uh, what about uh, Failsworth? Um, I, the gentleman over there in English says that the pool was announced to be closed. Is that correct? Hmm. Right. Now, I don't want to, about, I want, I don't want to know about... Councillor McMahon, I don't want to know about 24 million savings here and all this and going all around the houses. Obviously, we elect councillors to represent us in this building here. So what we're saying here, that some unelected officer has announced this on the website for the, we the public. Now, I'm saying that that is wrong, because if they're allowed to do this, which in my experience, they do it quite a lot, because 
because the lack of consultation in this lot here is very, very poor. Now, Councillor MacDonald, you must find out now which officer, unelected, has actually put that on the website, overruling what you, as an elected councillor, have just said to him. Take your point, take your point Warren. But like I said, the, do the documents, I don't know what the document is, Alan, and where it's come from. You know, so, as I, I said, if you want to give me that after... You know, when we're finished, you know, I'll, I'll see that. Uh, goes I think on it's right. fair to say that what was been raised by Alan uh, is, is, is going to be looked at by you guys yeah. anyway. Yeah. And we have got officers around the room. Um, and if you want to speak to the officers afterwards, give them your questions in writing. They, have, they will give an undertaking to get back to you on that. And I think that the debate that's just been sparked hmm. shows we are in a, in a democracy here because we're having a, a, a nice. Uh, so is it live the debate on this issue? And I'm sure that the councillors, the cabinet, will want an answer themselves to that. Yes, young lady. Um, my name's Joan Ryan. I'm from Shaw, and I'm here to save Shaw Bass. It just sounded from your speech that you just made then that you've already decided what you're doing. The, 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 what you've said sounded to me as though you've already made your mind up. Um, I just want to say it's been a costly and lengthy exercise and it's taken you nine months. You've only just told us. And we are fighting now you know, to um, oppose what your plans are to close Shaw Bass. You say that you're going to replace it and the definitions in the Chamber's dictionary about replace means to put something back where it was. <coughs> So not where you know where you think you know. The, one of your officers said to me today, "Can you think of things in Shaw where you think we can put the baths?" That's what she said to me today. It's not up for it's not for me Hope to say not. where I think the bath should go. It's it should be rebuilt where it is. We've been on the market all day today, handing these leaflets out. We'll come and help you in Gladick if you need it. And we're here to support and to keep Shaw Bass open. I just want to just produce some real figures, like your uh, officer did when she came last Monday. And I want to, to just tell you the cost of what it would cost a family in Shaw to come to Oldham Baths. The cost of the buses from Shaw and for a family of four, an entry to Oldham Pool will cost £35. Yeah. Times 50. That's for what, one visit. One visit. Is that Time, going back as well? Yeah, all together, return visit, £35. Times 52, that will be £1,820, as much nearly as their council tax could be. Uh, your officer said also that it wasn't a cost-cutting exercise, but she's produced all these figures in a recession. The highest unemployment we've had since the 90s, young unemployment, we've got redundancies, Warburton's just shut down. We've got high cost of everything, gas, electricity and everything like that. There are 2.3 million in poverty who can't even afford to buy the basics. And so obviously in this day and age, they're not going to be able to come and swim. And what we're about now is health and well-being from babies into adulthood. And we're looking from that, the government is saying all oh, these programmes that we should be setting up and that we should be looking after people. Um, and just lastly on this, I'm a member of Shaw and District Disabled Association. We have a, night, a one hour fortnightly session at Shaw Bass, which we've been running and going to for over 30 years. And it's the only pool that we go to that a, it's a dedicated one hour session and we pay, if we want the small pool as well, £1,820 for our disabled members to go to that pool and it's just a, a, a 26 sessions and that's £1,820 and we pay for that ourselves, out of our fundraising from the charity shop, etc., etc. And the last point I've got to make is... That was your last point. No, this, this one, the last point. As there is no money, that you're saying there's no money at all here in Oldham, how are you going to find the money to refurbish or stroke replace Oldham, which means putting it back where it was, 
and close and replace Royton where you're putting it back, where you haven't got any money. And I'm saying you need to take a good look at keeping Shaw Bass open because we're campaigning and we will carry on campaigning. Um, to be fair, I'm not saying there's no money, I'm saying there's less money. So there are decisions to be made about what goes because we can't continue as we were, clearly. No. So, can we just have one speaker? You can come in in a minute, yeah? So, Reuters and Crompton Pools um, need to be significantly refurbished or replaced. It's a fact because they're not in an adequate condition. Um, I'm telling you today, we're not going to sign off any report that says that that district gets two brand new pools. It's not going to happen because it would be far disproportionate to what other areas have. It's about equity and fairness. What we need to make sure is that whatever we come up with um, is fair for all concerned. I haven't personally got a view about whether the new facility is in Shaw as, uh, as opposed to Royton. I'm not, I haven't got a fixed view on it. I'm quite relaxed about hearing what, uh, what comes through, but I am clear that it's not getting two new ones, and I'm also clear that it's not an option just to wait until they deteriorate to the stage where they have to close anyway, and you have nothing. So we're taking a proactive step to make sure that there is a facility in the long term. In terms of the funding arrangement, um, for the town centre one in particular, it's a loss-making uh, enterprise now, we subsidise it significantly. Um, with a new facility, um, it would cost less for the repayments on a new facility than our current subsidy for a building that isn't uh, quite up to standard. It's the same situation for a new facility in Royton and Crompton. Um, the subsidy that is required to run those two pools uh, and the upcoming repair bills that we'll have, it is cheaper in the long run um, to borrow to build a new facility. So it sounds to me already that you've made your mind up. Mm -hmm. uh, you, what you're saying to me and in, the, in that way, you're saying to me that we're not going to get a pool in Shaw. Well, I haven't I said that. I, 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 I actually said that. to be very clear. Yeah. I, I, I said to be very clear that I haven't come to a view about whether it's in Shaw or Royton. Right but what I have come to a view on is that there's not going to be two brand new ones in that district. That's what I've come to a view but on. I, I, I just want to say that Crompton Pool is 112 years old. Oldham Bass is well. 40 years old. What went wrong in the building of that for it to be in the state that it's in that's losing money? And why, why, why didn't somebody look at that before? You, Oldham shouldn't have a new bath just because it's, you know, yeah, somebody did it wrong. Or you need, uh, you know, a competitive pool area or whatever. To be absolutely clear, there's no suggestion that the... Uh, the facilities were designed wrong. It's just that facilities change and demand changes for the type of it's use. It's got a cross in, in the bass. Now, the, the, the comment made about Crompton Pool and the age of Crompton Pool is a reason why it needs to be replaced, because it is over 100 years old and it needs uh, money spending on it. So the alternative is that we continue to patch up what is a building that needs substantial repairs or replacement entirely, um, or we allow it to deteriorate to the stage where well, we keep it open until we just have to close it. Well, then Oldham shouldn't be either. Hang on, hang on. Shh, shh, shh. We're, get, we're going to get unruly here. Uh, oh, I will I make the point, though, that the, uh, and, and you alluded to yourself, this report has been in existence for nine months. We only got control of the council in five months. Mm -hmm. You need to ask yourself, the local councillors who were campaigning to save this knew this was coming before the election. Yeah. We're campaigning, we're just we're public on the street. Oh. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 I'm giving some friendly advice that the campaign um, that's being run is being used for political purposes. Well, that's well, and there's an election to do coming. With us. And it's, we, just, well, we just want a message, sure. We can just, well, hang on, we've got, we've got lots and lots you. of questions, and I want people to have a say Categor who've not spoken before. Categorically, that, that campaign is being hijacked for political purposes. Um, by people who knew this was coming before the election and just refused to make the decision. Can, can, I, can, I... Did you, can we just, sorry, can, can, uh, let me just run debate. This young lady hasn't spoken, but she's been anxious <laughs> to make a contribution. Hi, I'm Marty. My name's Julie Alston. Um, I'm a Wrighton resident. Uh, who is going to be paying for these new f facilities or refurbishment? Is this going to be coming from the council or is this going to be coming from the new provider? That's just one question. Hmm. I've got another one. I think, I think what Jimmy's saying is that the, as I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to be independent here and just be play devil's advocate, that the, the pools you've got now are crumbling and falling down and are costing an arm and a leg to keep going. Mm -hmm. 
I think what the council is saying, if I'm, if I'm interpreting the answers correctly, is it's cheaper to have a new one and pay the, re the repayments on the borrowing of that new funds from wherever, from the private sector, from wherever, than to keep the subsidy on the old ones. So is the council going to be providing that money to facilitate those? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My next question is, already, yeah. how is the council going to feedback the results of the consultation to, from the general public and will the council provide evidence that there is a different outcome from the original proposal? Sorry, it, 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 the last part of the question was... If there's, a diff if there's a different outcome to the proposal, what are you going to do? What you're suggesting that? is if the, if, the, if the proposal consultation is, goes against what the council wants to do, yes. are you suggesting that they may not take that on board? Yes. Well, what, evidence that, are, what evidence are you going to submit to show us that you've done this in a fair process, that the consultation has been given from feedback from the general public and the residents of Oldham? You? Uh, I said that, Julie. I think what, what's, you know, the, if you put a, you know, some comments into the consultation, you'll get an acknowledgement of that, of, of that comment. You know, this is, no, this is, this is one I'm telling you now is going to happen. You'll get an acknowledgement to that comment. Then what will happen? The, the rest which will all, all, I'm just, can I just read from this? You, well, well, you won't. You'll get an acknowledgement, but not as a direct re reply. It will all be collated. And once that's collated, that will be fed back, to, so you'll actually know what what the what the result is of the consultation. The result of that consultation, you will be known to yourselves and the people who, who've been involved with yourself who turned the time to do it. Does that answer your question or not? The question was, if the answer from the consultation isn't what the council wants to, to happen. How will you then reconcile those two positions? Well, that, that's All right, Julie. Yeah. Well, that's something we'll have to look at, Martin. You know, that's something we'll have to look at when we get to the end of the consultation. And I do think that somewhere in there, if there's a compromise that has to be made, then we'll have to look at the compromise to what, what we are thinking and you know how, how the final consultation comes out. So, if there is a compromise, we'll have to look at the compromise. I mean, it, it, we'll, we'll make sure that the reports, uh, <coughs> the consultation results are on the website, so people can see what other people have said. I think that's, I think that's right and, and fair. In, in terms of will we change our mind, um, we were convinced enough that the issue being raised were sufficient enough that we had to do something, and that's why we've gone up to consultation. These aren't a fixed view, um, other than a recognition of the environment, that we need, and we need to do something. But what that something is... Jim, where did these uh, views come from previously to start up this consultation in the first place? The, 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 these have been based on um, the operating costs the income and expenditure and how much it costs to run and the condition surveys broadly and also the geographical coverage so where centres are in relation to each other in terms of travel distance and competitors. So it's quite a factual um, desktop piece of work but there are always local considerations that we just don't know about uh, that users know better than we do and that's the idea of the consultation so uh, we can't promise today because we're not preempting the outcome of the consultation that things will change and what we can say is that we've got an open mind and we're genuinely going to listen to what comes back. Right, I'm going to take one more question on this, because we don't care. Just one minute, please. We've had 25 minutes on this now, and, I don't, and if we get a chance, we'll come back to it afterwards. But we have got some other issues. And this young lady here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jenny Matthews. I'm a resident in Shaw, and I'm supporting the Save Shaw Baths campaign. You need to tell these, not me. I'm, I'm just... Right. Just and um, I, I can only see Shaw going to the dogs. I've lived there for 42 years. And uh, we've lost our tip, our market's going to the dogs. I don't care what anybody says, walk around it, you'll see it's going to the dogs. Uh, you say we sh we, we're the same area as Royton, why aren't we sharing their health centre then? What's going to happen to Shaw's health centre? And if Royton and all the other outlying districts have got their new health centre, why haven't we got ours? And if Royton have got the health centre, we're not getting one. Why can't we have the new baths? The, 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 there's, a, there's a broader issue about the concerns about Shaw Centre full stop, isn't there? And, and the, the market's part of that. And, the, and I, I absolutely agree um, that taking this women pool away from there, if that's what happens, won't help. You know, it's obvious if we take footfall away, then it's going to have an impact on the town centre. Um, Go and have nothing I, left. I think that's a given. John's granted the, the, the health centre. 
uh, bit in particular. We, we don't underestimate the challenges um, that, that come with it, but we need to find. No worries. It's football. It's a footfall. Footfall. That's the one about people, about people coming into the town to spend money and to use the facilities. Um, every, every point you made is legitimate, and we're going to take it into account. We haven't got the answers here um, today. What we've done is to, is to get a framework for consultation and some ideas on paper, so that we can say, "What do you think about this?" Um, but to do nothing isn't an option. So what we need through the consultation is for people to come and say, accepting that doing nothing is an option, you need to look at doing this, this or this, and to come back with genuine alternatives. John, do you want to answer the... Shh, yeah. come in, let, let, me, let me just try and manage this in a, in a, in a civilised way. John, you, the question was about why I'm sure got its own health centre. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, throughout the district, uh, Failsworth, Oldham, uh, Royton, uh, Moorside, Gloddick have got new health centres. So in the same way the government cancelled the Building Schools for the Future programme, cancelled the Housing Market Renewal programme, they've cancelled the Health Service Building programme for new integrated centres. So Shaw and Saddleworth have missed out particularly. So you know, the council are more than happy to work with the, yourselves, the Parliament Care Trust and the local MP to lobby the government to say we've got to have new health facilities in all the districts. So if there had been a continuation of that programme, no doubt that Shaw and Saddleworth would be next on the list. But the coalition government, which we don't support, obviously, has cancelled it. Are you happy? Are you, that's a fact, isn't it? I mean, oh, no, I'm not happy at that. Well, none of us are happy, because I live in Saddleworth and I haven't got one either. And you, you live in Shaw and you haven't got one. But I think the answer was, uh, specifically, that the, the, the government's come in, and we all know the, the, the amount of cuts that the government's put into it, and it's not the local council's responsibility, if I understand you correctly, John, to fund those health centres. Okay. It's the NHS. Correct. And they funded all the new ones, the one in Royton, and the integrated health centre on the car park here, yes. and the one at Failsworth. They've been funded nationally yes. and not by this council. Correct. So the ones that were cancelled were cancelled as a direct result of central government. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. What, what, I'm, I'm not going to take any, I'm sorry, but we've had uh, 25 minutes on shore baths. Now, what, I'm sure you will. I, I'm, I'm going to... It's just that you did bring politics, Mr. McMahon. This is the last question on this, then we're moving on to something else. bring politics into, um, you, you know, what you said. Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, leaflet was produced, and um, the council, it says some of your aims, and the last one on here, if people have got a copy of this, and you need to get a copy of it. It, it does say that the, the council wants to contribute to the regeneration of Oldham and Royton town centres only. Sure. We're from Shaw, we pay our, our taxes, but why didn't somebody put right, Shaw in there, even if they didn't mean it? Uh, and also, um, the, consul, the um, meetings that were scheduled were only scheduled in Oldham and Royton. So what you're trying to do, I don't know whether you're trying to do it politically, but we have fallen off the edge of the map. Of your map, whether it's political or not, we are not quite sure. You brought the politics up, but certainly we are not mentioned, and we need our town centre needs to be mentioned. And Shaw Bass will, um, if Oldham New Bass and Royton New Bass will contribute to the regeneration of Oldham and Royton, knocking down Shaw, uh, Shaw Bass will certainly mean the degeneration of Shaw. Um, uh, the, the, the contribution you made, I don't disagree with. Um, what we'll say is that this isn't a politically motivated move. This is politicians trying to balance the budget, and this is one way of doing it. Jim, you made it political. Uh, well, well, you well, said political. No, no. I wouldn't. Uh, be, be absolutely clear. I what, am be, apolitical. Be, be absolutely clear what I said. I said the campaign has been hijacked for political purposes, and it's a fact. That's not, 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 you can disagree about whether we should bring politics into it, um, but it's a fact of the matter. What I'm saying is, this isn't politically motivated. Um, well, why not show sure, then? I, well, the, 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 there are a number of things that have come out um, today which have been news to us. The first one is the paper going out about Gloddick and not allowing for a community transfer is news to us. 
the leaflet not being so specific and excluding Shaw and Compton is news to us, and we're going to take it up. But I can say categorically that was not a deliberate act to try and uh, dismiss Shaw and Compton because we understand the concerns are legitimate and it's fair. No, you're not. Somebody's not doing their job then. Well, I think James, I think James is accepting that and he said he will look into it. Okay. I, said, I think he's trying to say he's, they have not deliberately marginalised Shaw. No. No, I'm, I'm saying categorically we're going to do something about those two issues that have been raised. He, he's giving you an undertaking now, on the, live on the net, live on the radio, with the Old Chronicle here, the advertiser here, in this public domain, that he will look into why Shaw was left off that document. He'll also look into, and the Cabinet will look into, why the website this morning said that the baths are going to close. And, I, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I've been asked to chair this independently of the cabinet here. I mean, I know these guys because I write about them. I, hope I write about you people as well in the Chronicle and you all buy the paper. But I'm trying to be independent and I'm trying to get through a lot of issues here. And I don't want to cut people off. And if we get a chance to come back, because obviously it's an emotive issue, the bass, and leisure's an emotive issue, but there's lots of other people taking the time and the trouble to write in and have their say on other issues. So I think this being local democracy week, I'm going to say now, in the terms of democracy, I am moving on from this debate to something else. And we had a question from Margaret Oldham, uh, who came by Facebook. It was the first question we received, and given that she took the trouble to actually be the first one, I'm going to read her question out now on her behalf. Why do highways not repaint road markings when they become worn out? This is a road safety matter, and when we ask the highways, they say they don't have the money to rectify this. What plans do the council have to remedy the situation? I understand this is your department. Jean? It certainly is, yeah. Um, I mean, the straight answer to the question is that they do, but the, that kind of work has got to be prioritised along with other kinds of work that we do to the highways, and that includes repairing potholes and resurfacing road surfaces that are presenting a danger to the public. So when road surfaces are resurfaced, then the white lines are, are replaced as well. When there is a significant problem with white lining, then it is replaced. But it has to take its place within the budget alongside other things that sometimes might be more important. Who actually pays for, for, the, uh, for the road linings and the, mar and the pothole repair? Is it the local authority or is it the highways agency or is it central government? Depends where the road is. If it's the motorway, then it's the highways agency. If it's our roads, the ABC roads, then it's us. I mean, there's another question that's coming that I can probably roll this into, if that helps, about how much OMBC have paid out in the, in the last 12 months in compensation for damage to cars. And, uh, that that question came in from David McGeeley, who was sat yeah. here with his cams on, and he's reporting to the great big okay. community, that's Oldham Community Radio. And Dave, are you happy to have your question answered? Well, if I, can, uh, if I can ask the question, By all means the, the background is I'm getting rather terrified of driving in and out of Oldham. It may be the same elsewhere in the country uh, because I have to find that I'm driving round holes in the road and I've had back springs and front suspension and I've spent a fortune on the car uh, recently. So it's basically around that, you know, concern about that. The question was, first of all, how much has Oldham paid out in the last 12 months in compensation? to damage cars and pedestrians in consequence of the potholes. And it doesn't have to be exact, you know, £10,000. I, mean, I, I could be, when you tell me the, the sum, I might fall off my chair in, in shock. Um, so I just sort of said to the nearest £10,000, but, you know, the nearest £50,000 is better, that'll do. But following on from that, then so it says, when was the last report from the highways regarding the current state of Oldham roads produced? And I'm hoping that you're going to say we have these on a monthly basis or we have them every two months or every quarter or whatever. And then the final bit, so it says, what's the current situation with regards to potholes uh, and poor road surfaces in Oldham? And what concerns, if any, does Oldham Council have if we have another severe winter. And that's the crucial test, because some of these roads were all right this time last year, and all of a sudden there's great grand canyons emerged in them over the winter, and they're still there as we go into the next winter. So the three there, so hopefully, nice and short answers, because then we can get on well, Your there. question wasn't very short, David. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need at least one to answer just, it as you took to, to ask it. Can I, ask, well, can I ask you to accept 
and, I, and I'm trying to be, you know, play independence man here. The, the last two winters have been particularly severe. And I, thought, and, and, and I, go back, I was born in 1948, and I can remember the fogs. But the, the last two winters have been the worst in, in my memory for a very, very long time. And as, as I think we keep hearing tonight, the council's skint. So we should all put a, <laughs> we all pay a bit more poll tax, and I pay a bloody fortune where I live. You must, you must my, have a big that's house. That's my fault, isn't it? I live in a flat. I can't afford the house. That's a, it's a posh flat if you do. You wouldn't swap, I tell you, my little flat. Anyway, Jean, over to you. Right, OK. Um, so the first part of the question was about how much has been paid out in compensation in the financial year. And the estimated amount for this year... Uh, it's estimated that that is 2.15 million on 343 claims. Now, those claims... Um, is that in a 12-month period, Jim? 12-month period, and that includes those that are related to highways, and well over 50% of those claims are claims that relate to highways. So what you're saying is all that money went, didn't go on pothole claims to cars? No, but well over 50% of it did go on things like trips and falls on pavements and on, on problems with potholes in the road. Now, the issue here is is that we have had two very severe winters and quite sensibly the previous administration looking at that a couple of years ago went um, and borrowed £10 million to be spent over a period of four years on repairing those roads that were in the worst condition. That's a four year programme and we're currently in year two of that four year programme. We regularly review the situation with the roads because, as you quite rightly say, we might have a road now that isn't on the list of the most important roads to fix because it isn't as bad as one further, further affair. So after the winter period, it's not that every road deteriorates by the same amount. That's not how it works. So a road that might have been perfectly good in November, come February, you might take another look at it. And there was one in Failsworth where, where that was the case recently. Um, and we say, well, actually, that one's deteriorated, so it's now worse than some of the ones that were at the top of the list. So we reshuffle the list. Okay? That £10 million, pound, I have to say to you, is not enough to solve every problem we've got with potholes and with road surfaces, but it is it going some way towards it, and it allows us to prioritise it. The only other thing I would say about that is that if you've got a pothole in your street, you can report it to the pothole mole. If anybody wants to know where, what the pothole mole number is, I haven't got it off the top of my head, somebody can probably get it for us during the meeting. Uh, lady at the back there, and she'll, if anybody's interested, she'll be able to tell you by the end of the meeting. And we'll put it on our screen. Right, okay. Yeah, uh, you know that? Was there yeah. another part to the question? Oh, there were loads. Uh, well, yeah, there was a bit. Your leaders said, have all turned off now. Your listeners have all turned off, David. When, when did you get the last report from highways? I get, regu I get regular reports um, from highways. I have a, a regular meeting, and we have yeah. got a list that is currently the list that we're working our way through. We're at the point in the year now where we'll start thinking about what will be the year three um, list. But again, as I've said, that will then be revised on probably February, March time. We'll start to look at where the winter has had the most impact. The town. Can I ask you a question? Uh, that money that was paid out, was that for revenues or was that insured? No, it's in the council budget. It's, it's a budget. It's, it's a budget issue, yeah. so that comes from revenues. Yeah, that comes it? from yeah. our money. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there are some of... There are probably two uh, associated issues. The first one, um, at times we do potholes and don't repair them properly, so we have to keep going back out and redoing the pothole that we did months ago because it wasn't done right in the first place. And we are looking at how we can do potholes in a different way. Uh, and to be very clear, and I'm very clear on this, there are people who think the council is a soft touch to come and make a claim against. It's a council, so we'll sue it. I was a bit worried when you said you were going to fall off your chair that you might put a claim in if you, if you injured yourself. Uh, and I think we, you know, there are some claims that people make that we have to knock back and say, actually, you're trying know, because people do. Okay, uh, just um, talk about the bus, is it? No. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, no, I'm only, I'm only joking. I'm just it's, telling you uh, Joanne Ryan again. I just wanted to ask a question. Um, I've tried two avenues to get it sorted out, and 
the both sides. Sorry, no. Joanne Ryan. Thank you. Yeah. And they both said it's not for them to deal with. Um, recently, well, for a number of years, I think it's um, wagons I noticed are coming from the Big Lamp roundabout and going across the top of um, Oldham Road past uh, St George's School, going towards Oldham. Um, now, these wagons are uncovered. They're full of the loaded, full of soil and debris. And before, um, I have contacted Highways Department and they've been carrying off and they've, they've um, done something about it. The wagons have started being covered. So wherever they're coming from now, I've tried the same this week. Um, I did manage to get the names because one of the ladies at Highway said, oh, you need to get the names off the front of the lorries. So I've done it. And I put in the details to this lady, and she's rung me back and said, oh, it's not us. We don't do anything about that. It's the police. Right. I've been to the police today. They said it's not them. It's the council. So if you could... Uh, either speak to somebody in the highways department because before I've had it, it's been sorted. So I don't know if it's changed. Do you but know I'm, where they're coming from, Joanne? Do you know well, where I they're know only from the, the big lamp? Right. In so, Shaw. But you don't know where they're, they're picking up all this? No. Right. I can okay. only think it's Milner or New Way, somewhere down there. Um, but I don't know, but the, the full, and there is debris falling into the road. Now, if that, a water soil or a brick or something falls out to one of them and hits a car windscreen, then you will have a claim on your hands. Leave me your email address. I'll pick it up with the highways officers tomorrow and I'll make sure you get a, a proper response. Yeah. Okay. So there's a more helpful response. Yes. yes. Okay. The right answer. Just before Sorry. before you go on, um, said the pothole mole, anybody yeah. wants the number for the pothole mole, is 770 1685. It's on the screen. It's on the screen. Technology at work. Or email pothomo at oldham.gov.uk. There you go. You said that very well. Thank you. You could get a job with David on the radio. Right. Um, In spare time. Moving on, we have a question, another question from Gerald. Um, the one about the amalgamation of Breeze Hill Schools. Have you got it there? Just read it off here. <coughs> Is this for you, Abdul? No. In the light of the amalgamation of Breeze Hill and Council Schools and the move of the Council School to the Our Ladies site in Royton, was the prime motivation social engineering? Steve, you don't need to answer. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got it down as, as Javar's answer, but you can oh. do it if you wish, because it's your show. <laughs> I think with, with the issue on social engineering, Gerald, I mean, obviously that, that's been a topic which has been, you know, flowing about here, there and everywhere. I think what you have to look at is the overall picture. I mean, there were BSF schools and they're coming together. And I think also you've got, with the Catholic school on Broadway, uh, was it Newman School, isn't it? And the issue there, the, the, there's likely to be roughly, I'm told, about 10% Asian, Asian children. That figure could rise as it, as it goes on. I don't believe it's social engineering because, in fact, the two schools are doing, uh, uh, from, from a community point of view, one's from an, you know, a strictly Asian com community and the other one's from a white community. The work that's been done, particularly at Camp Till now, there's been a lot of good work being done by the, the previous head teacher and is still carrying on to, to amalgamate them schools. And I think, I don't agree it's social engineering because that's, you know, a thing which people are pushing around. But there's a lot of work to be done in them schools. It is being done. And I'm fairly sure we'll see a success of, of, the, of the communities coming together. But I, I, don't, I, I don't particularly like the word social engineering, Joe. Are you OK with that? Uh, do, do you want to pursue it further? Yeah, thank you. Great. <coughs> Just to be are these questions on the last question, or are we going back to a new subject? Yes, Raheem. Mohammed Raheem again. Of course, quite a stir last time. Um, in terms of the new academy, um, we do welcome that from, uh, from certainly the uh, communities around uh, the Breezy Lake. But I think one of the things, I know there's resources put in place at the moment <clears throat> in trying to get both the communities to work very closely together within the school but there will need to be a lot of resources put in once the school is erected and all the school uh, the kids are going to that mm. um, and this may be agencies that are 
you know, funded by uh, Oldham Council and others as well, they will need to go into that school as well to do a hell of a lot of work. I fully agree with you. Fully agree with you. Because, like I said, they have to be a success. Because they have to maintain 1,500 kids in, in, in all the schools. Now, if they don't do that, we've got a problem on, on, on the funding of them. But, like I said, I, I fully agree there has to be a lot more work done to do it. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah um, can I just uh, come in here? Um, first, to, can, I, can I go back to Cheryl's question? Uh, I mean, your question is right. Is the prime motive social engineering? Absolutely not. If you look at the record we have, the Labour Group have in this town on, on education, it's been phenomenal. The prime motive here is to provide excellent schooling for all our kids in the whole of the borough, and that's where we come from. If I take you back to when we did the sixth form college, you could have said we were doing uh, social engineering, but actually it was about the education offer. And if you look, it's been a phenomenal success. And what we achieved through that, we tried to replicate at a secondary level. So the Oldham <coughs> Academy North, which is the Grange and the Our Lady coming together, is going to have the latest state-of-the-art facilities backed with the expertise in teaching. And yes, of course, there's an issue about uh, community creation. We don't underestimate that. But the prime motive is to provide our kids the best education that we can. Uh, and the point Rahim is making around uh, Waterheading Academy, the Oldham Sixth Form, co sorry, the Oldham College is the sponsor for that. So there will be hopefully a direct route for some of the kids from the academy, Waterhead Academy, to the uh, Oldham College. So, and they're working very hard. I'm on the governors of Oldham College, and I can assure you, right, the motive is there to provide the best education for our kids to make sure that we unlock the potential they have and actually help our resident to raise the skill base that we have in Oldham. Uh, the leader talked about, in the previous answers, about we've got to create the skill base. So in green technology, there will be a huge amount of new technology coming in around solar panels, around uh, um, re re renewable energy, uh, renewable heating system, that kind of thing. Oldham College has already started the Green Technology Centre. And what we need to do is to build on that. So we're not going to wait for the kids to come to Oldham College to do that. We're going to start in the secondary schools. And one of the ways of doing that is having these uh, academies. I can assure you the prime motive is to provide the best education for all our kids, regardless of their back background. And I mean, that's, that's what will do it. If you build a brand new building, but the education just isn't good enough. Parents aren't going to want to send the kids in, it'll be empty, they'll send them somewhere else, further afield or wherever. If you provide an excellent quality school, parents want the best for the kids and they'll send the kids there. So a new building is part of it, but it's only half of it. If the teaching quality in the school isn't good enough, then it's not going to work. So up, up in that is absolutely uh, critical to it, it's beyond just a new building. Yes, Raheem, is this a question in response to yes. the answers? Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a comment really, more than a question. It's uh, apart from the, the children will get on with each other. There's no doubt about that. I think the, the communities where, from where the children are going to be coming from as well, there will need to be work around, done around attitudes as well. Um, I think what we I, don't want that is that being brought into school. I think. At the end I, of the day, I, I think. Being. If I can come back, uh, Martin, I think you raise a very important point. And it is an issue. We recognise that. But I tell you this, right? As I said, I sit on the Oldham College Government and we're the uh, sponsors for what we had. And as far as that is concerned, that is one of the key issues that we've been working from when this idea came about. So that issue has been looked at, it will be continue to be looked at, and we will make it work. But to make it work, we need the parents and the children to respond to that. And I'll tell you how they respond. When they find out the education offer at Waterhead School is one of the best in the country, not just in Greater Manchester, but in the, they will respond to that in the same way that people responded positively to the Sixth Form College. And that's the recipe. Uh, and, you know, I'm not just saying it here because you asked me the question. We passionately believe in education. And we've got a track record. When John was leader, we built a, a primary school every year of the time that he was there. He built the Sixth Form College. We, we got the university center campus. We've got the academies now. And, you know, Oldham is a deprived town. And one of the ways we're going to change that is to raise our edu education base, raise our skill base 
place that we have for our residents. And, you know, we can do that. And there are new opportunities with the new technologies being developed. And if we position ourselves correctly, we can take advantage of that. Can I, okay, can thank I, you. Can right. I, can I just, just, just walk more well, quick into it? Very quickly to Raheem. Can I just say, Raheem, you've got an issue with, with you know, the Muslim community around the Gladi Curry. Quite a number of the, the parents now are sending them up to schools in Salawat, for example, Spring, Spring Ed. So it's happening. You know, the move's coming. There is a change coming. And, and I think, again, you never force it. It has, to, it has to be, you know, progression. And I think that that will happen over a period of time. I see the advantage of that. Right. We've got 20 minutes left. We... Sorry about this last thing. Um, I welcome what you just said, Jim. Um, a lot used to happen that, very similar in, in Count Hill as well, and also Brinton mm. as well. I think the first thing what parents do want is the safety of their child. Exactly. And now, if the safety is there, they will, and they're happy, they will move yeah, forward. They'll move well. themselves. So, but if things start, go on, start going wrong, mm. what you will find so is you'll start basically, mm. you'll get another Brazil or you'll get another counter where it's 99.9% mm. one um, culture. I agree. Okay. Okay, we've got 20 minutes left, and the, 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 I, I thought it was going to be a long night, but it seems to have flown by. What I want to do now is get in a lot of questions about things that are important to us, like the parking, and the next question, which I think Gerald's going to ask for me, is about the town hall. Well, it's, also, it's also been raised up on the screen there, um, the concern around the town of, about property that once belonged to the council and just seems to be falling into dereliction. Is it not time that something was done about it, a decision made, even if uh, tragedy of tragedies, that decision is not the things down? David, I think well, we the last thing that. that we want to do is knock down buildings that people value and have got a very sentimental attachments to them. We're looking at the old town hall, which has been there for years. Uh, there's been cosmetic efforts made to uh, make it look busy. Cartoons put up of windows, which at the time I opposed, I thought it was ridiculous. Unfortunately, some of the work that's been done to repair the roof has made it now uh, dry. And the impact of that is that the, build, the walls inside are crumbling and falling apart. The fact is that we're trying to do the best we can to bring the town hall back into use. The, the library is going to be part of our uh, cultural quarter down at the bottom end of uh, your Union Street. And the answer really is it is time to make decisions. We're making decisions. We're hoping to have some announcements before the end of the year. Have you any idea what th those announcements might be? I think it's premature to speculate. Well, 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 the answer to the question is, of course, we know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> um, but if the second question is, will we tell us that we're not at the stage where we can go public because we're still getting costs uh, worked up for a number of those? But I can say, uh, Alden Town Hall is high up on the list. The old gallery is high up on, yeah. on, on the list. Uh, and I mean, I, I came into politics through community groups, through a historical society. So, so, so I get the cultural heritage bit. And actually, you know, when we talk about Oldham being a diverse place, what we always uh, seem to forget is the thing that brings everybody together, which is a place. And it's a bit that's had so little investment in its infrastructure and in recognising the history and heritage. Um, that, again, we're starting from a low base, but we are absolutely determined in everything that we do on Union Street, in the town centre, the old town hall, on the gallery, that heritage is going to be at the heart of it. If I could just, on behalf of the shall we say, the media fraternity. David's over there, the editor of the newspaper, and I, I write there as well. And I know that David and the advertiser are here as well, just to be totally inclusive. Well, if you can and just contribute, I, I also uh, present an old community radio. Really? So I, I, didn't I do know have that. a vested interest. That's great. But what I'm saying is, we mire these guys to death to give us artists' impressions and plans and to say, stick your head over the parapet and tell us what's going on. And, the, and, and we are, we are, we're with you. We, but I want to see Oldham improve. I've, I've lived here since 1948. I want to see Oldham. It's my town. I want to see it happen. I think, and I'm not defending these guys. Don't get me wrong. I'm not defending them. I'm just trying to be fair. I think what they don't want to do, the new administration, is put something in there, and we've seen it at the Hollywood Bowl. We've seen the stuff about the Wilson Bowden put out about the Clegg Street and going into the old town hall. We've seen plans for a bowling alley. We've seen plans for a new theatre uh, by the Mecca Bingo over there. We've, we've seen so many plans, all of which have fallen by the wayside. I think we'll all agree with that. I think what the guys are saying, what the guys are saying now is, when something concrete is in place, they will tell us. Mm. Oh, oh, and no. we'll tell the crumb first. Sorry, guys. Do <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. But, yeah, we, <laughs> we, 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 we have to be honest. Um, 
you know, the roads are in littered with best intentions. Oldham Town Hall has been a victim of best intentions. There's always been a new scheme and a new master plan just coming round the corner that it was left because tomorrow somebody will do something with it and tomorrow, and when it fails, don't worry because then somebody will, another plan will come. Um, there won't be another master plan coming from it and there won't be an artist impression when we do say what we're going to do, we're just going to go in and do it um, and get it sorted. And I mean, I mean that's a, uh, a promise. But um, I think the Oldham Town Hall, regardless of political administration, Oldham Council, uh, has cast shame on politicians in Oldham and we hold our hands up to it and we'll sort it. Does your well, that's the right assembly and we so did say earlier, I think, I think the guys did say earlier that they, were, that they would hopefully, by the end of the year, by the turn of the year, they might be in a position to just whisper something to us. I mean, in terms of right to assembly hall, um, it's been publicised, the, uh, the, the administrator needs to secure best value which means that they have to go to the market and see what offers come in. I can say categorically we, are, uh, we will be putting an offer in based on its market value. Okay, uh, I'm moving on. I did say I'm going to get through lots of questions. We had one here sent in by Twitter from Robert Craig. Will the Cabinet give an assurance they will not reverse Oldham's progressive waste collection service and return to weekly collection? Yeah. Who wants to field this one? David? I'll Gene? Say, uh, oh, Jean? Jane. Both of you. Yeah, well, who's going first? No, go right, I'll go first because uh, I introduced the scheme and Jean will go after me because she is currently administrating it. The fact, is, is, question. the fact is that this has been one of the most... First of all, the answer is yes. That's a simple answer. We yes, will not be reversing it. Because it's been far too, far too successful to reverse. And the key, the key factor that made it successful was our insistence, the politicians' insistence, against officers' advice that food waste should be collected every week. That was the key factor that has made it a success. If it had not been a success, every single person in this town, and I mean man, woman and child, not just electors, would have been faced with a fine of possibly £60 each per person. And also, I suspect the recycling element has, 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 increased, yeah. has, has been a part of your decision. Yeah, well, absolutely right. Jean, do, you want to exa do you want to just uh, expand on that, Jean? Yeah, there, I, I mean, there's nothing to add to what David said, only to reiterate that the success of our scheme is about collecting food waste weekly. And the, the reference to fortnight collection, we don't have fortnightly collection in Oldham, we have managed weekly collections, which means that your food waste is collected once a week, then on alternate weeks the grey bin is collected, and the next week the recycling bin is collected. Where there are councils that are being targeted for having fortnightly, weekly, fortnightly collections, the problem is that the food waste is, is staying in the bin for a week, or in some cases, people are told to put the food waste in their green bin, so it's staying for a month. That's not acceptable. We're happy with what we've got, and we're going to stick with it. The other reason that we're happy with what we've got is that the recycling rates have improved considerably. And that's really, really important. It's, it is about being a green town, but it's also about the, the, the cost to send things to landfill is going through the roof, and it's only going to get more. And everything you send to landfill incurs a fine for the people of this borough. Because you pay the council tax, it's you who would have to pay that fine. Oh, that's, that's why we're happy with what we've got. David? Just very briefly, people talk about two weekly collections. Just bear in mind, in Oldham we have two collections weekly. Okay, uh, and we have a question here from, on Facebook from Martin Ashurst, which is very close to all our hearts. I'd like to know why we have brand new parking machines in Oldham and they still can't give us change. And we still have to overpay. Gee, I can tell you why you've got brand new parking now. machines. Um, you've got new parking machines because the government was set to introduce new coinage earlier this year. Now, they realised that they got a lot of backlash from various businesses that, that depend on coin-operated machines, that they couldn't introduce it earlier this year because people wouldn't be ready in time. They are going to introduce it in January, so we have to be ready for that because the existing machines won't cope with the new weight of coin. We bought second-hand machines that are a year old um, because we wanted to save money to the public purse. And I will investigate this issue of them not giving change, because they should give change. Well, they never have. 
No. It cost me a fortune. No. Well, to be fair, they designed to give change. They don't give they don't give change anywhere. If they're designed to give change, they should give change. If they're not designed to give change, we've got then you need to take. We've got in, in all them the world's foremost designer of coin yeah. mechanisms, Dave Bellis. Yeah. And we've got yeah. coin controls, and we've got innovative, uh, and we've got the most innovative man in the planet on coin machines, and we don't get any change. Um, Question, please. Question, please. One, I've got, I'm, I'm going to come back to this bass no, issue. No, so no, can you be no, quick? it's not that. No, it's to do with this. Go on, How then. can you buy second-hand machines of coins that have not been printed yet or made yet? Because... There's a mechanism. I've looked at coin controls and can be re-grown. But how would you be second-hand? Not second-hand machines. I think the question was, oh, we're buying second-hand machines. They're second-hand to us and they've been reprogrammed. And Sorry. the ones we've got couldn't be reprogrammed to accept the new coinage. The ones that we've bought in can. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, Joanne. Right, this is a question for Jim McMahon. Um, I just want to know, uh, you've just talked about right assembly, I'm just going to go back to that. You have said that you want to buy it back. For what usage? And is this how you're going to start regenerating Brighton again? Because you'll have the health centre and the assembly hall. I want to know what you're going to use it for. Well... In, in, I mean, in the spirit of devolution, it's for the members in Royton to decide what they want to happen to their town centre. It's not for me to impose my vision of uh, Royton for them. Um, Royton members have been clear, I mean, and to be fair, across political parties, isn't a political point, that Royton Assembly Hall uh, is a scar on Royton and something needs to be done to it. Um, we've allowed the private sector to mess around for years and they've not sorted it. Um, and in the interest of trying to bring, bring an end to it, because it was a council that sold it uh, in the first place and created the situation uh, so we have a skeleton of a, of a shell today. Uh, I think we have a moral obligation to go in and sort it. But there is um, a rumour that's going round that it could be used for the bass, that you've already earmarked that no, for the bass. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be big enough. Um, I mean, the, 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 the types of discussion that we're looking at for the district centre is say that um, the same issues you've raised and the people have raised about Shaw Town Centre are being raised by members in Royton about the precinct and the number of empty units. Um, and if we're able to get a development that would start that, then the Assembly Hall site would form part of a wider development of the Town Centre. Mm. But you Alan, just one quick question on this, please. Uh, yeah, just to sort of follow up on that, um, obviously there's a lot of people in here from Shaw. Uh, you've talked about you know, um, regenerating the scars on Royton. What's the chances of me coming collecting you and the chief executive and taking on a tour of the scars of Shaw? Yeah. 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 Sorry, just on top of that as well. Is this the, the regeneration of Royton and the degeneration of Shaw political in any way, shape or form? Well, the, 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 the quick answer is it's not. Because what, just from a... If we were political, we're not stupid. Um, and first of all, and it is a political point, there is no such thing as a Lib Dem area or a, a Labour area in Oldham. The, the way people vote, um, the, the people aren't stupid, they vote a particular way to get a particular uh, return. Um, and that is, it's our aspiration that we will have some representation at some point in that part of the world. We've not wrote it off and we're not doing things deliberately because we don't think uh, that Labour has no chance of getting in there, quite the opposite. Um, this doesn't have to be, and it's a mistake if we embark on a road that says it's either Royton or it's Shaw, and it's got to be one or the other. Because the, the, the town centres in particular are town centres in their own right. The problem is there are structural failings in both town centres that we need to address. In Royton it's a precinct, and it's Shaw, um, it's other issues. Um, now, there isn't a bottomless pit of money, and we do have to prioritise. It's made easier at Royton because, by and large, the private sector will develop Royton. Um, and the land assembly is reasonably straightforward. Shaw sure isn't that type of town centre. It's not a precinct that's in one ownership or two ownerships. It's a high street that's in uh, probably 50 or 60 ownerships, I would imagine. And trying to regenerate something like that, first of all, is time consuming. So if you look at the fails of regeneration, um, I think we're on year, what, we're on 14, 15 years. That's been going on and it's still not finished. Um, because it started with complex land ownerships and compulsory purchases. So my advice, speaking as a, somebody from Failsworth that went through uh, the district centre there being done, is uh, unless the land ownership is straightforward, do not embark on trying to acquire sites in a piecemeal way. Otherwise, you'll end up with a town centre that takes a decade to recover from it. Mm. OK, just one minute. There's a guy at the back there been hand up for about an hour. I'm sorry I keep missing you. I thought you were an officer. Trouble, Sean Carlton, Vice Council. 
why is it that you never consult the petition for the parish, which is another branch of the government? Can you perhaps explain that? Because I didn't have a meeting with you and all the subs who were bringing it forward to us. We've never had a say in the issue. We, you have members on the uh, district partnership and it's their responsibility to feed back relevant issues to the parish council. That's why that link exists. So I strongly uh, refute the claim that we haven't consulted because the district partnership uh, have discu uh, discussed it and Hugh has got a date of a further PAC meeting and you have parish council members on there. So absolutely that's not a correct uh, assertion to make. This decision was made. There's no decision. Can we, made, can we just ask this decision being which decision? Well, for instance, come to the group if you look at that. The content is not to be considered on the list. Why don't we put it back on the list so that at least we can have some negotiation back? There was none of the district partnership all the back and it came at the last minute. To, 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 to be absolutely clear, if, if this plan had said we're going to close right and pull them to rebuild something in Shaw uh, and Crompton, the same people who are here today would be replaced by people from Royton who would be saying you're damaging Royton Town Centre and you need to reconsider that. So you have to have a starting point for consultation somewhere. Um, and, and, and we've got that. Jim, we're already damaged enough though in Shaw. I, well, I mean, I mean, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm not dismissing the issues in Shaw. What, what I will say is that the issues in Shaw aren't isolated to Shaw. The same issues about the viability of the high street and the market and all the other stuff are the same issues. You walk on Royton uh, Precinct, it has a similar number of vacant units as Shaw's got. There's no difference in that. So the issue isn't whether we do something with Royton versus Shaw. The issue is we need a plan for all of our districts to make sure they're viable. But, you know, to be fair, we, to, 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 to be fair, it makes it very difficult to do a question and answer if I'm not given the opportunity to answer before you come back with the next question. Well, no, because the, because the fundamental issue is we've got into a debate about whether it's Shaw versus Royton, and it's not a healthy debate, and it's not an attitude it debate, and it doesn't need to be. The, the, the issue is we need, we need a plan for Royton Town Centre, and we need a plan for Shaw Town Centre. It shouldn't be one or the other. But then, you, Jack, can I just speak? I'm gonna, well, Jack, can I, can I, can I, can I, well, well, I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak because I'm in charge of the meeting. So I'm going to ask. We, we, I did say I would get back to the bass issue. Right. So, and I'm going to do that now. Yeah. Sorry, Warren. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to. With respect, a, uh, I'm sorry, Warren. We've had Twitter questions. We've had, we've had the web. There's people here. Yes, and you've had your say, tonight. you've had your say, no, and just, I'm going to let other people have their say. No, I haven't, because I wasn't informed that the public could speak here tonight. I was informed that you'd have to write the questions in. And my important question is to do what that gentleman says, if you don't mind, Martin, please. Well, we're moving on. I, Warren, I'm sorry, but we're no, moving on. No, because you know what the question is now, because you know what the question is at all. The question I'm going to ask next is, is, is about the, we've had a, a question on the screen for quite a long time, and about a number of people asking yeah, me about... We've had the ghost to turn up tonight here and me. ask questions. And I, can uh, I say, Councillor... Warren, you can't uh, hijack this meeting, I'm sorry. He's doing a good You're job not going to hijack this meeting. Months. I'm not hijacking. Turn your microphone off, please. I'm not. You're not, you're not going to hijack the meeting with all these he's people doing here. And he's doing a good job. He's had, he's had that's, good well, I'm, that's good for you. Well, let him have his say. The question was, on Twitter, how come Manchester can reopen the historical Victoria bus, but we can't keep open Shaw bus? Now, that seems to me... A question that everybody here has been pointing at for an hour since it came on the screen. The, well, Victoria Baths in, in Longsight was part of the BBC uh, restoration mm. project, so there was a particular fund that was set up to restore it. Yeah. That fund doesn't exist anymore. Grant funding on that scale uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and of course, Victoria Bass uh, was a grade either one or two listed building, so it had national significance. It wasn't just that it was a, a, a swimming bath uh, in Manchester and it was a district swimming bath, it was a swimming bath of national significance because of the architecture in there. So, um, whether that type of funding would be available to refurbish uh, Crompton, um, I would say it's, it's highly unlikely, but let's not write it off. You know, we, can, we can look at everything, but we have to be practical and we need to find a solution that's viable. We can't just have a, you know, kind of our head in the clouds and ignore it and just hope that everything's going to work out. Uh, in politics, you have to make decisions, and that's what we're here to do. Yeah. Peter, one last question. Right, one last Turn your microphone on, please. It's not so much a question as a comment, although there is a question at the end of it. I think what's, uh, what's happening this evening 
uh, albeit it seems to be just two areas that seem to be, be dominating the discussion tonight. That's not to say that you know, they're the only ones here, they're not the only ones here, but a lot of talk has gone on about that. It's obvious from what's happened here tonight that consultation is a very important thing. Now, Oldham Council has a terrible record as far as consultation, certainly over the last two or three years anyway, when I've been in the consultation process. Communication is going to be much more important. You've got two districts here tonight who are actually dominating this situation. That demonstrates that you really should be having more of these meetings at the face, right? At the face, <laughs> not here. <laughs> at the time that it's announced, <laughs> not 12 months later when it's too late and everybody is aggravated by it. Well, uh, Can uh, I, uh, just a minute, Jim? Just a minute, Jim. Excuse me. Don't, over, don't, don't over talk me while I'm trying to answer a question. Or ask a question. Uh, right. Um, uh, certain things have been going on tonight, and a lot of things have been said about money. And yes, money is a very important thing. And as Jim said, they can't do everything. But the people of Oldham are amazed at the fact that from when we've got a terrible situation, economic situation, the budget can find £5 million to buy off a piece of land that was bought last year for £2.1 million just to keep Oldham Athletic in the, in the town. I find that very, very difficult to, uh, to swallow. And the best, of course, all come into that as well. Well, the, 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 the consultation issue, when, when I finish responding to the second point, Huey will announce, well, probably people will know the date in the audience, but he will announce for the purpose of the people who don't, the date of the Shaw meeting to discuss the BAF. So there is one booked in, and it's not 12 months after the decision has been made. It's been done uh, in the right way. In terms of Latix, um, OK, so we inherit a situation where Latix buy a piece of land on the back of the council supporting stadium development. We have two issues. We either support the stadium being built there, or we find a solution uh, that gives an alternative. And we went down the second road. Now, if you say, Pete, that after all the protests and all the other nonsense, you're happy that a stadium goes on that side. Yeah, unfortunately, that's how we've been treated with Failsworth. No, I've got to yeah. say some of the personal attacks and abuse that have come through the Failsworth Stadium development that's also well, um, would lead me to the view that it was nonsense because it wasn't productive to try and resolve the issue that was affecting the community. Now, we've come in, we were alive to what the issue was, and we found, within the constraints that we've got, a solution that does two things. First of all, it puts to bed a stadium going on Long Memorial Park, and that was important. And secondly, it means that Latix are a viable club in Oldham. So what, what else could we have done? We either we accept it's a private company and we're going to lose it from Oldham, and it's another thing that Oldham hasn't got on top of the cinema and all the other stuff. And it's just another thing for people in Oldham to say, isn't Oldham rubbish because... And we won't let that happen. It's not just about football and kicking a, a football around the field. This is, this is about the town's confidence. And had that have gone, it would have damaged the town's confidence. Uh, and I fundamentally believe that. I don't do football. I, I don't get the fascination with following a ball around the field. Um, but I absolutely get the importance that it has for the town's confidence. And that's why we did it. Now, the, the, the figure that you said for the land purchase, isn't it accurate? I'm not going to go into what the figure is sorry, today. Sorry, I've got it here. No, no. The, 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 the that registered document is £2.1 million. Pound. No, sorry, I'm not, I'm not disputing that figure. I'm disputing no. the, the figure that you claim we're paying for the site. It's the figure that I'm disputing. The, uh, on, on, on the Oldham website and the crop. Well, well, it must be true, then. It must be. It must be. It was in both. And I think it impacted the advertiser may have had it as well. Well... Well, 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 what I can say is that the, do, the deal hasn't been done uh, as we sit here today. It's still um, dependent on development values and land values and independent assessments. We can only pay, this isn't a blank cheque, we can only pay what the independent value would say the site is worth. Are you saying, Jim, to this meeting tonight, can I just say, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to short circuit things here, please, let me just run the meeting as best I can. Are you saying that the deal is done in principle to buy the land at Failsworth and bring it into public ownership, but the, the figures haven't been dealt with yet by the consultants and surveyors and professionals? The, 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 there were two elements to the um, deal that was reached. The first one was a grant payment, and the grant payment has been made. The second one was land purchase, and the third bit was development values. So a grant being paid, land values based on the assessed value that it's worth, and if we develop the site, the increased value that development would bring. And that's basically the, the deal. So it's only the first element that's been uh, settled at the moment. That, that's the figure that's in the public domain? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. OK, so have you got can a question come, on that just, issue? Can I just come back on that then? So if, in fact, you find that it comes to £5.1 million or whatever it is, that's what you've got in the kitty to pay for it. Can I just add to that, by the way? 
Land values and property values in Fairless have gone down by 6% this year in the last 12 months. 12 months ago, in fact 18 months ago now when they bought this land, it was bought for 2.1 million, including the Lancaster Club, not just the land. So I, as a ratepayer in Oldham, expect to see a fair deal. I want to see what it is that Oldham is going to pay. What's his name? Corny? Alec Corny? Where is Simon, Simon Corny. Corny. Simon the chairman Corny. Of the owner of that. Yeah, Simon. Oldham, 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 Oldham Council are going to pay Simon Corny, who's just gone and bought it back from his two amigos, who paid £2.1 million for it last year. And I think the people who Oldham would want to know that as well. So, you, so what you're suggesting is that the that Simon and his I think the two amigos have gone now. It's Simon's own club now. But, so, well, that's by the by. But they no longer have day-to-day -day control of the football club. What you're suggesting is that Simon might be making a profit on public money. Exactly. That, that's the germ of your argument. Exactly. Can you answer that, Jim? Well, the the, the reality is. If it works and if Boundary Park is redeveloped and there's a hotel and a conference centre on there, then ultimately, as a shareholder, he will benefit from public investment. It's a fact, and I can't deny that. But the town will benefit from having a viable football club and a stadium that's fit for purpose. So the, the justification is the public benefit. But the, the, the money that we have paid over in grant funding, the 700000 is not the £5 million that's been reported. The land, the, the, the land values are based on us doing a development on the site that returns the cost of that development and land purchase to the taxpayer. So once the site is developed, and I'm sure we're going to have fun and games uh, down there when we come forward with, with some suggestions about what it could be as well, the taxpayer of Oldham, in the widest sense, will get a return on that investment. It's a property deal um, in, in the way that we undertake other commercial arrangements. So. Um, listen, don't, don't, don't anybody think that we've come into the control on council, we've found a stash of cash and we've just gone on a shopping spree, because categorically that isn't it, that kind of money no, doesn't it. exist to do that. And we have to justify, not just to you, but to ourselves before we make a decision that it's the right thing to do. And whether people agree or not, uh, our motives were absolutely right. We got good advice um, and we believe ultimately it's the right thing for the world. Did you, did you want to come uh, back on that, yeah? Um, Just put your microphone on, please. Uh, to, uh, Tell us your name again. Rona Lewis, uh, to Jim. Um, you, you have just confirmed with uh, Mr McDonald that there is to be, eventually, uh, a meeting in Shaw about the proposal. I know when that is, because we, the public here, have... Um, Organised that meeting. The pack. How you came about it, I don't know, but it certainly wasn't him Is that it? called the meeting. No, I'm not, it's saying, that, I'm not saying it was. No, I'm, no, no. I'm, I'm just making that clear that it's the people here. Otherwise, Shaw would not have had a meeting scheduled by the council, and that's what you need to know, Mr. Oh, McMahon. Okay. That we weren't no, in here right. and it's we weren't scheduled. Be. Only Oldham Centre and Royton Centre were scheduled by the council to have a meeting. And so we decided, yes, we would have our own meeting and invite the council. But is so that not, is that that not democracy at work? And you, have, you have got your ward no, councillors. democracy. If you've got your ward councillors, should you not be going to them and saying, why well, are we not in, in here? In partnership with them, that's what we've done. I mean, that's what I would do. That's democracy. Well, that's what but, we yeah, have done. Quite right. But I, we can't leave it that... Um, you're pointing to Mr. McDonald you're, as though he's done it. You were trying to say that he's... We've done it. I don't think that Hugh is trying to take the credit no, 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 can for starting that meeting. Can you, Do you just answer that? I think the suggestion is, Jim, that uh, Hugh, that, the, that, that the, maybe the, the council is trying to take credit oh, for his meeting. No, no. Let me just tell, tell you what will happen with it. The, the meeting followed the meeting what, what they had when the, the residents from Shaw turned up at the uh, district partnership. No, let me finish. District partnership. Now, what happened with that? There was, there was quite a, I, well, should we say, an hectic, hectic night, I believe. Now, Tony Larkin, who chairs the district partnership, then, then got, it, got in touch, and I, I approached Tony Larkin with other, a number of people about getting a joint pack meeting in Shaw. Now, Jan Joshi, who's the, who's the district partnership officer, arranged all, all, all that stuff around it. Now, the district partnership chair was in agreement, and that meeting's been arranged, as far as I'm aware, for the 26th of this month at St. Paul, Paul's Church. 
at seven o'clock. Now, all I'm just saying to you, I'm not claiming nothing. No. I'm just saying what the mechanics were in getting that meeting together. We, we all know about that meeting. Did you say that? Yeah, we all know about that meeting. B -b -b because we arranged Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not arguing who's arranged it. And it wasn't no, from that. I think we're arguing across purposes yeah. here. Yeah. I think it was from the parish meeting. I'm quite where happy. We I'm quite to happy for this debate to continue, right. but I think you're agreeing with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Raheem, have you got a point to make on this issue? Or bring something new up? What, can you just tell me what it is before you go online? Because we, we, we're, we're overrunning now by ten minutes. Do you wish to spend it? I hate the standing orders. I understand the order. It is a <laughs> standing order to you. <laughs> Warren, we're all very, we're having a great time, <laughs> but there comes a point when the great internet up there, no, people get bored. Raheem, what's, what's your point? Mohammed Raheem again. Um, it's mainly around finance, really. Um, we understand that there's mad law that's being built as well at this present time. And then you've got Oldham Sports Centre as well, right across well, Stone Throw Away. I've been to the Bolton Lads and Girls Club as well. <laughs> uh, as a regional manager, I was working around uh, most, most north of England, really. How is... Wait, wait, can you just get to your point? Yeah, we're going how out of time. is Madlow going to complement the work that's already been going on at Oldham Sports Centre? Because as, as far as I can see, it's gonna, if it's twinning with Bolton Lads and Girls Club, you're going to have two facilities, a stone throw away from each other, when others are being closed. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take that here? It's a huge difference. Yeah. Madlow, as, you, as you're probably aware, Raheem, and I think you're on the board of OCL, aren't you? Yes. And there's issues going around with, with OCL that the, the, the cost of Madlow, which I believe is five pounds membership a year. I think it's five pounds, and then after that, it's fifty pence a session. And Madlow, the intention is is working around the, the, the it's part and parcel of the youth offer. But it's also about giving giving youngsters a taste. And, and quite clearly, they're working in, in as far as I'm being told, they're working in close contact with OCL, so that the, there's a natural move over for the youngsters to get older. But Madlow, we'll have to see how it goes. I mean, I've been to the uh, boys and, and girls club in Bolton as well. Now, if it works on that basis, quite clearly. I mean, I, went, I don't know how you found it when I went in, but it was quiet, it was well run, and it was full of volunteers. And these are what the youngsters are involved in. A lot of the youngsters are involved in Madlow, and I think Madlow is going to be an asset to this town. But the question, how, how it keys in with OCL, wait and see. I think we'll all have to wait and see to see how it is. But I know OCL have got reservations about the cost of it. I think the basis, I mean, as I understand it, the, the Madlow development, because I've been involved from the word go uh, on the private sector, and the, is going to just take people off the streets, is it not? And Whereas it's going to be complementary to OCL, it is. is it not? I think it is. Can I just one... Uh, Raheem, can we just... Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, Martin, I'm David Wilkinson from Higgins Village. Uh, we've been approached... Uh, from Madlow, from the new sets up there, that the, the, the intention that's been put across to us within, within the voluntary sector is that they're going to look to see that if we, who, who run various ventures, can actually bring our people to the Madlow to fill it. Not the opposite way around, they're not bringing people off the streets, as, as you just put across, Marty, but they're actually looking for existing groups to bring their volunteers and their the young, people. young people up to the Madlow. That's defeatist. It's just up scratch to the smaller groups like mine. It's just going to fold. I mean, the, 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 the village, I'm 150 yards, 200 yards away from where this place is being built. Why were we never consulted four years well, ago? Well, I mean, I, I mean can, I, can I just say, at the end of the day, Madlow, and I think you're aware of it as well, is quite clearly started off in the private sector. I mean, Oldham Council put, think, I think there's three years funding a £400,000 a year for the next for the next three years, but most of it was found by private sector people. Madlow was based, as I've just already said, on, on the, the, the thing at Bolton. Now, quite clearly, it will have an impact overall on the youth provision in the town, I would think. So it's how, and all I'm just saying is be patient and just wait to see what goes up, goes on. And I know there's people working there, like Ellen Taylor's working in with Madlow, and she's doing a lot of work with the community and trying to develop it. And, and you know, it's no use killing the, killing the goose before it's got off its feet, is it? And, you know, just let's see how it goes on. But I think Madlow's definitely going to be our asset, David. Yeah, but uh, my, my concern there is, is that this place you talk in February, is, is that right? March. February, March. March. Why is it only now where they're worrying about how they're going to get people in there? Why they should be looked at four years ago. 
before they even started putting the foundations down there. And the place where it's been built, I mean, I was told from one of the councillors recently, we asked why it was built where it's built. It's a stupid place to build it, right facing Bluecoat School. You've got no parking around there. You've got issues because you're right next to a lot of uh, retirement homes and, and retirement flats. When these kids are coming out of there at 10 o'clock at night, which is the time I'm told it'll shut, who's going to be, well, how are we going to deal with them complaining that they've got kids rock walking the streets at 10 o'clock at night? But, 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 uh, I think you, this is an example of where the council gets blamed, whether it's the council's fault or not. I'm not saying it was a council, yeah, I know it was part of the enterprise, uh, but why was no one consulted? Uh, 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 as, a, as a council, uh, you know, we weren't in control of the council at the time, but we would have made the same decision. When somebody comes and says we've got a shed load of money, we want to invest in young people in Oldham for a flagship facility, are we going to say no? Of course we're not. I'm not saying you should have um, said no, you should have asked where to put it. No, no, but, 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 but you need to be very clear, this is not a council facility. No, it's, it's a, it's a it facility is. that's run by the private sector. And to be fair, there was consultation during the development of that, I don't know how sure wide ranging it was, but it was. But it's not always the council's responsibility to step in. Uh, and sort it for people. Sometimes, you know, these are just the way things happen. I'm going to bring this to debate now, the debate to a close, because we've, we've overrun by Mark, 15 minutes. Mark, if you can just come in on the consultation, as far as, we, as far as we've been informed, in terms of the consultation, a lot of young people across the borough have been involved in the design of Madron, mm -hmm. what kind of activities should be provided from within that centre. And like uh, Huey said, we've got to just, just sort of suck it and see it, basically, how it's going to plan, pan out. Bas it could add value to what uh, the sports centre does because it's not going to provide the same kind of services that, that we've got at the sports centre. They, they are different services and it's there for young people to use. And it's for under 25. I know parking could be an issue, but how many of our young people are actually going to be able to afford to drive in the current uh, economic climate that we've got? If I can come back on that, there's an obvious answer to that. You talk about young people. I'm not talking about young people driving. The people who are going to want to go there, their parents are going to take in a lot of instances. There's no way I'm going to let my 13-year-old son walk up on the on a Drive Thursday, Friday, Saturday or Sunday night and come out at 10 o'clock when we've got a big AS breed problem in Oldham and antisocial behaviour because of the drinking going down the road. I hear what you say, but I went yeah. along uh, as a journalist to the very, very first Madlow meeting uh, when Mr Holroyd, who's the chair at Bolton, came with the idea and the proposition before it was even, it was just a dream at that time, and he said, the only way this will work is if it's in the town centre, so people can come on the bus. And that's the proposition on which Madlow was formed, not only in Oldham, but around the country. I've got to bring it to a close now. I don't want to, I'm sorry David, I don't want to bring it to a close because we're having a good time. I think Warren made the point that it's been a cracking meeting and, and it's been a very, very worthwhile exercise. And I thank you all, but we've got to close. We've overrun by 15 minutes. Can I move a vote of thanks to everybody, please? Can I say that this meeting tonight has been facilitated brilliantly by Martin. I think all the cabinet members... <laughs> the question well. I think the public who turned out have asked, asked very, very good questions. What a difference from the meeting that was held in Royton last Monday. It was a total and utter disgrace. Thank you, Malcolm. Well, I appreciate what you're saying and I hope, I've, I hope I've been fair to everybody. But I think Jim wants to just close the meeting on a formal note. Well, it was only really to, I suppose, follow what you just said. First of all, thank you for taking the time to come. Um, we... We did think of long and hard about whether we were going to do this or not, not because we were about people turning up and kicking off. Uh, in fact, I, I, I've enjoyed it more for the energy that's in there. I think it's been fantastic. But for fear that people wouldn't come. Because our experience is that we lock ourselves away in this chamber, six of us. We talk nonsense for three or four hours. Correct. We bore ourselves to sleep. Some people actually <laughs> do go to sleep. Um, <laughs> I think they get these glasses with the eyes printed on that we don't know. Um, and actually, we, we, we just don't touch the people that we're here to represent at all. And, well, he's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, um, and, uh, Let, well, you can solve it, Jim. Let us speak at the partnerships. The rules are there. I've got the rules. The club won't print the letter. The editor's here tonight. I've got all the, the rules of the partnerships that you lot here, with respect, not you lot, you people, according to the rules that I have, which the Cron won't print. And I've asked the editor what he was afraid of. I have it all in detail that the public can participate in the partnerships. Without the public, Jim, with you, you're not going to win this battle with the constraints of the budget you're in. OK, thanks for that. Can we now Martin. just allow Jim to, to, to wind up? Because it's, we're, 25, we're 20 minutes beyond deadline now, so can we just let Jim wind up? What's happened? 
since the borough was formed is that now and again somebody hijacks a meeting and they kick off and they embarrass politicians so we introduce a rule that restricts them speaking at the next meeting and over a period of time we get more and more restricted and actually if you're a politician who can't answer a question you shouldn't be in the game because you're there to represent people and you should be able to explain why you made a decision you've made and actually Warren I don't always agree with what you've got to say that's not news but absolutely you've got the right to say that and we've moved so far away from what proper dem democracy should be about a two-way dialogue that, we, that we've ended up in a situation that actually, if you design a system today, it wouldn't be this because it doesn't work. So we, we take on board. I think a monthly meeting is probably pushing it, but we're certain, we're certain that maybe a quarter meeting is very powerful. Obey the rules of the partnership, please. I've got it back on one. No, I've, 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 I